What's up everybody? It is I, Rich Roll, your host here once again with Lord Adam Skolnick, soon to be property owner. <laughs> Rocking the Wait. Low Tide Boys baseball hat today. I am. Yes. Shout out to the Low Tide Boys. Shout out LTB. How you doing today? You know, um, I wore this jacket for a couple of reasons. Number one is right now I've transitioned into baby secret service agent. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, like <laughs> when the babies start crawling, but not just crawling, but crawling really fast. Yes. So now. April and I have to triangulate to make sure we have Zuma covered. Mm -hmm. So it's like, he'll be cruising and looking for her around the corner. I'll be like, you got him, you got him? Yeah, you yeah, I got piece. him. Yeah, I got him. Yeah, yeah, you know, you got him. It's on you, yeah, <laughs> Renegade, you got Renegade? I got <laughs> right. Renegade. That's the code name for Zuma. I feel like Zuma is a code name. <laughs> yeah, Zuma is the code name. You know? Renegade was uh, Barack Obama's co secret service code name. That's oh, what yeah, they called him during right. the campaign and he kept that's it. Right. So I'm, I'm, you know, borrowing that. Well, from, good to see you. Good, good to, to be. Good to see you. Back with you before we uh, corrupt people with our respective biases. Yes. <laughs> I should mention that what we do here in this special version of the podcast that we call Roll On is we talk about a variety of matters that are just of interest to us. Um, over the past couple of weeks, we do a little bit of show and tell. We share some wins of the week. Good news, we're about good news, right? Usually. And yes, <laughs> once in a while, we're kind of back to good news today. <laughs> we're back to good news yeah. lately. Uh, and we also rounded out with uh, some listener questions. So mm. if you guys want a question fielded for Adam and I to discuss, you can leave it on our voicemail at 424-235-4626. Also, before we dive in, if you're watching this on the YouTubes, please subscribe. Same goes for Apple and Spotify. On that note, quick shout out to our Clips channel. We have a little nascent seedling we're nurturing with this mm. channel, but we did just hire a full-time editor, all praise to AJ. AJ. Who's piloting it. We're uploading two clips every single day and we'll probably increase that at some point. So if you like to take quick peeks into the plant-based meat and organic potatoes of what we do here uh, for each episode, that is the place to do it. Um, so subscribe to that channel as well. There's a link to it in the description below and in the show notes, or you can just search Rich Roll Clips on YouTube. Love it. What is up? Well, the other reason I wore this coat is, wait, is it is it too soon to get the water? You can get the water. You can't, you shouldn't get in the water in the, first, se the first segment. That, that sort of signals that you're nervous or you have some kind of anxiety disorder. Or just disorder. Like dehydrated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if you're furiously sipping from the water in the first 10 <laughs> seconds of the podcast, something, something might be awry. Something's wrong in your yeah. life. Yeah. Um, secret service duties are yes. dehydrating you. I wouldn't want me as my secret service agent. <clears throat> <laughs> um, no, went out of town this week for the first time, went up to uh, the wine country behind Santa Barbara, nice. where it's really lovely in the hills there. And uh, it was one of those places where you have to wear like nice clothes to mm -hmm. get in for dinner. Right. And so I wore this also. You wore, you wore that. That's yeah, seen, I haven't a lot taken of, it off. seen a lot of mileage in the last 72 <laughs> hours after being in your closet for 10 years. Exactly. Yeah. You know right. me so well. I yeah. feel so seen. Right. I also feel like you showed up in a matching shirt today to me. We're, we are kind of matching. Yeah, that's kind of odd. A, a kind of floral pattern I know. button down. So oh, it's a good news day. Well. Um, everything's good though. Uh, the big battle's coming up. I'm excited about that. Which big battle is that? Remember the swim oh, right. run, big yeah, battle. Yeah, yeah. Hence the low tide boys hat. Exactly, Nicholas Ramirez and team Envol mm -hmm. have launched this cool thing because there are frustrated swim runners all over the world. Really most of them are in Europe to be quite honest, if we're gonna be fair. But Le They're less frustrated in Europe because they're actually good at it. Right, but they can't do it in right. Europe. We're yeah, yeah, more yeah. vaccinated. Although so. I did just get a, an email from Otillo saying they were opening back up or okay. I didn't, I can't remember the details. It's of that, gone, but. it's gone up and down. Some races right. have been canceled, some have not. And so it's kind of this chance to get race organizers, some spotlight, have swim runners kind of join in something and take all of June. So basically it's everyone who wants to join signs up at Envil's uh, website and 
basically you get points for every three kilometer or more swim run that you do. I believe it's three kilometers, mm -hmm. three or five. And a couple couple of euro of your 30, I think it's 30 euro, something like that. I'll tell you right now. Um, it is, no, 13, it's just 13 euro. Um, and a couple of those bucks go to Sea Shepherd. Oh, nice. And so it's pretty pretty cheap to sign up. And then you can every, like I said, every 3K swim run, which is not much, um, as long as you do two swims and two runs that you log, you get a certain amount of points and then you get a point per kilometer. And if you do right. more than 10 kilometers, you get even more points. You get a little bonus per kilometer. And when does it kick off? Kips, kicks off June 1st. June 1, it's, right. it's all of June. And Envol is spelled E-N-V-O-L. That's right, envolcoaching.net. You know okay, envolcoaching.net. Yeah. And I am on team Low Tide Boys. You are. I am. You're really stepping it up. Really? In the swim run world. You feel Making like- Making a name for yourself in swim run. I think it's because I'm the only mainstream journalist that has written about it twice. <laughs> you have, you have, <laughs> I know. I don't even consider myself Two a mainstream journalist. Two New York journalist, Times pieces on swim run, That's right. courtesy of yours truly sitting right here. You know, you launched me. And now we we were joking before the podcast, we're, we're like, <laughs> we become like a swim run podcast that's not a swim run podcast. Yes. You don't really this quite. This is not yet. a no. swim run podcast. No, you don't so want. We're to talking to a yourself. very small subsection <laughs> of the audience right now. Although, but I see, I feel like some of your audience like is starting to. It's permeating out right. there. They want to get like, into yeah, it. It's just it's just filtering into the unconscious uh, collective beehive mind out there. And you know the point is the big battle is the perfect time to try it. Mm -hmm. um, you can do like really small amounts of of kilometers or you know, mileage. You, know, you go out there, you swim for a quarter mile, run for a mile, swim for a quarter mile, run for a couple miles yeah. and, you're, and you're home and you're good. And yeah. you've, you've got, and you can easily do that. I, I did, I, from my door, I, I used to love doing this 8K swim run, which I will do again during this June uh, big battle. I stopped doing it during the winter because it just gets cold in that swim run suit, but I'm back in the swim run suit without the legs mm -hmm. and, um, and really excited to get after it again. It's cool. Yeah. Um, you do need access to water. We had a listener question about that a couple yeah. of weeks ago, right? I don't. A think lot of the pools, I think, are starting to open up right now. Do, I wonder if I don't, I don't know, know what the, deal the answer is in California. If what Nicholas says about pool swims, I, I would imagine pool swims are fine. I'm, I'm sure, sure they, they are. Make, yeah. How many people live on a coastline where they have access to getting out in the open water? I don't know. You're taking our our small subset of the audience and dividing it into an infinitesimal. infinitesimal <laughs> no, but I think that's a good thing. I think yeah. we should we could further polarize even more. Get the people <laughs> by the water to resent the people without water, yeah. or vice versa. On the subject of of pools yes. and water. I came across a story in the New York Times. I didn't put this in the outline or in the show notes, but maybe Blake can pull it up. Blake, search uh, New York City pool in the East River. Oh, right. Did you see this? Yeah, it was in the New York Times posted, today. You just posted it, yes. Right, this is very cool. So apparently the New York City has just approved this project yeah. to build a floating pool in Dumbo right in the middle of the East River, right. and it's got this bridge. So Blake's it's like pull icebergs, it up. but yeah, the like, East River. Exactly, it's like <laughs> icebergs <laughs> sitting in the middle of the. Yeah, so it's not icebergs. I should also say <laughs> before we get a little deeper into this, we're trying something new today. We're upping our production technology game. We've yes. got this big monitor here, so we're going to do the whole thing where we pull up clips and, and talk about them that? a little bit. So that's two. There's two Olympic, one Olympic size or 125, 150, it looks like? It looks like, well, definitely one 50 meter pool, but it, it appears that it only has four lanes. Like Blake, if you okay. scroll down, you can see uh, a mock-up of the pool. That's a little bit <laughs> Why does um, it look more like zoomed a in. cross? <laughs> but what it also does, and see, so yeah, it's a cross. So one, one way is, I believe it's four lanes of 50 meter, okay. 50 meters in distance. I'm not sure what the, the other side of the cross um, is in distance. But uh, also there's some kind of uh, technologically advanced filtration system. So it's okay. actually also cleaning the East River at the same time. I love so it. So there's an environmental sustainability component to this thing, um, which Super is very cool. cool. So anyway. I, I'm all for it. I love, first them, of all, I love Dumbo. It'll take, <laughs> hopefully it'll take them less than 10 years to build it. It looks super futuristic and cool. And it if that works, it seems like, something you could replicate in all kinds of cities across the world. It also looks with the sun rising and that- It's well photographed. Design. Or mocked it, up. It looks like- Rendered. Like the Catholic church is behind it. 
because of the cross. <laughs> yes. Or it looks like a pot dispensary symbol. <laughs> it's like, no, it's, it's very cool. It is cool. Can you imagine if you lived in Brooklyn and you could just cruise out and, and swim there every day? Um, that would be pretty cool. It'd be amazing. Yeah. It is beautiful. I wonder if it'll be open, if they'll heat it for the winter months. I think it said in the article, it'll be open for 15 weeks out of the year. Yeah, I would imagine. First, they gotta build it. Is it, is it a barge? Like, does it move? I don't think it moves. Okay. See, there's a, that walkway, right. that kind of architectural path that okay. looks pretty long. That looks like quite a ways out in the river. It does. Anyway, super it's very cool. very exciting. Um, what else do we wanna talk about? You know, well, how should, are you? You know what we need to do? What? Well, yeah, first of all, I'm good. I'm glad I, to hear. Uh, I uh, have two things that I wanna talk about. The first is that today I feel really good. My energy is excellent, but I would say since the last time that I saw you, I've actually had a bit of a hard time. Like I've been struggling like with, I wouldn't call it depression, but just a lack of energy or enthusiasm for life. Like just waking up, you know, are we still in the pandemic? Are we not in the pandemic? Right. Like I live out in a remote place. So I'm already kind of deprived from a normal or adequate amount of social interaction with the exception of, of coming to the podcast studio and doing this thing. Right. And I just found myself confused and um, and also just having, just, just being challenged to focus yeah. or feel plugged in to life. Um, and it's, it left me like it's, it, it impacted my sleep. It impacted my ability to train. Like I was really having a difficult time just getting out there and getting active. And I came across an article, this article is from a couple of weeks ago. It's by friend of the pod, Adam Grant oh. called feeling blah during the pandemic. It's right. called languishing. And I think languishing is a word that perfectly captures how I've been feeling up until literally this morning. That's how you, that's your, I that's think, your, yeah, that, that's your inner that's self. That's me before I, that's your inner I self. Cut, before I cut my hair, right? <laughs> Staring at a muffin. I don't know what that is. <laughs> or no, an orange. Um, and I think, you know, we'll link this article up in the show notes, yeah. but Adam, I think really perfectly captures this, uh, I don't know if it's an epidemic, but a lot of people are having this experience right now. It's yeah. fairly common, yes. even though I felt like I was the only person who was experiencing it and reflecting upon it. I think if you really think about it, we've just gone through an unbelievable year of insane political turmoil of stay at home orders of being afraid initially to even, you know, touch our groceries yes. and we're sanitizing everything and we're terrified of our interactions with other human beings. And now as we start to emerge out of it, I think we're in a stage of, of, of dealing with, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to call it post-traumatic stress, but there is a stress that we've all weathered. Right. And I think without confronting it and really, you know, in our own respective individual ways, finding a way to work through it, you can't just expect that it would disappear. It's like, oh, bad, we're back no. in the world now. And no. like, everything's fine. Like that was a crazy year, yeah. you know? Like we've just gone through it. Even, you know, look, obviously some have had it much worse than others. And I've had a pretty, you know, charmed um, version of, of this year. But at the same time, you know, I've still, I still think, you know, the, the, the everything that we've kind of gone through collectively has an impact on our psyche. And the isolation, yeah. Um, you know, like we, we went through the isolation collectively where usually being alienated is kind of, you feel like the only one, this time everyone is kind of doing that at the same right. time, but that doesn't lessen the impacts of it. Sure. But I, now we're in this stage of like, we're good, right? Are we right. good? Like, let's go. And then we went like, to, we can went, we go? Can right. we, yeah. like you were in a hotel room, right? For the like first, first hotel room yeah. in a while. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm sure when you walked into that room, you're like, Okay, like, Dude, are we okay? Is I mean, everything good? Like, you're, you're talking to someone who is like <laughs> a professional right. travel writer for a decade. <laughs> right. Like, I, I was on the road nine months a uh -huh. year for you know for Lonely Planet alone in a lot of these places, and and to be um, back in the hotel. Like, we we were thinking about going to Hawaii for ten days or so, and then we just couldn't get our minds around bringing the baby on the airplane yet. We just mm -hmm. weren't quite comfortable with that yet. So we decided let's give this let's do something really simple the first step and it was comfortable. And, you know, 
He got to eat in a restaurant for the first time. It's like mm -hmm. big advances. I got to see a bunch of animals and have a good time with them. Like, you know, like right. at, at a, like a petting zoo, it was hilarious. It was right. good, but it was the first time. And there was this reticence. There was this kind of hesitation. I would suggest potentially another aspect of this for you, because I've felt it myself a, hand, a bunch of times, the re-entry process after doing a super highly concentrated, intense story in, in a different location than coming mm -hmm. home, you don't really notice it. It takes like a week for you to settle in. And after that, you're like, whoa, uh, nothing really matters as much as what that experience was right. like. And so that the the adrenaline pumping and the high and the and being on location during a very intense period of time, uh, you know, this is right when the verdict was happening. This mm -hmm. is like there was another shooting. Um, and and you're out there for that, talking to people deeply involved in it. And then you come back, it's gonna take a while for you to feel like the other podcasts matter as much as those podcasts matter. That's not to say that it doesn't, it's just a feeling sometimes, I'm I'm, I'm projecting, yeah. but I've had that with stories where I feel, sure. yeah. It's, yeah. it's uh, you know, it's that scene of Jeremy Renner walking, right. through, you know, wa exactly. wandering down the grocery aisles, exactly. like, you know, pining to be back in, in, in a combat situation, right, right. you know what I mean? And you understand why, you know, people of that ilk feel like they have to continue to redeploy right. or work correspondence. Exactly. You know, Dan Harris has spoken about this. Like he he basically was like, I was addicted to being dispatched to all these crazy places and being right in the middle of some insanity. And then you come home and everything is just blah and muted in comparison to that. And Sebastian Younger, I think just yeah, did, did exactly. a documentary and now he's got his book out about right. the same thing, bringing the, this group of guys, some of them are military, some of them were correspondents together and they're like walking the rails together mm -hmm. to try to mm -hmm. kind of come to terms with what they went through. Right. So I guess what you're saying is that what we're all collectively experiencing is a, is a tiny version of that. I think that's true. And then I think specifically you, given the time frame that we're talking about, just still about a month since you got back, maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe a little projection in that. I'm not so sure that, that it's rooted in the trip to Minneapolis as much as it is a reckoning with the last 14, 15 months, but yeah. I feel good today. You feel so good today? I'm on the other side of it. That's the thing. That's the thing about emotions. Even when you think you're stuck in some cycle that you can't escape from, they tend to always change. You just gotta wait for the- Feelings are just feelings, man. <laughs> feelings are feelings, yeah. man. Well, that's like this weird moment that we're in is also this, you know, everyone's in their feelings so much. And it makes you want to, it makes me want to be in them less. Mm. Like I want to be in mine less. I want to feel less. Mm. Isn't that, is that weird? Is that bad? I'm trying to wrap my head around what you mean. So basically because of just the, the dissonance and the vitriol that's yes. out there right now, yes. like just go out and have an analog experience and enjoy your life. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. go out and just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, touch the ocean and be in right. awe, you know? Yeah, and I feel you. Yeah. Well, speaking of of getting in touch with our feelings, yes, I think we do need to talk about the Brogan situation a little bit. I oh, don't know that you and I need situation. to process this very much. I think yes. we're good, right? You <laughs> and I, we're good. Yeah. And now we, that my operatives have gotten to you, <laughs> yes. I, well, well now, done. well it's, done. Talk team. about impacting my psyche, <laughs> but I feel like maybe we need to process this a little bit okay. for the audience. Yes. So, let's so, do it. The Brogan thing. Uh, continues to resurface its head. I've been on the receiving end of quite a few emails and comments posted on social media <laughs> that I'm still being too mean to you and that I need to be nice to you. And, you know, Brogan will never take your job and oh. how dare I, you know, right. court affections with an interloper. How such dare as you? Him, a giant man <laughs> with a huge heart and a big personality. Yeah. So just to be clear, um, I guess I can be nicer to you. It was all, it's all been in good fun. I thought we talked about just, this last time. Yeah, it's we did a little bit, but, tongue in but cheek. it continued to, it continued to, to crop up a little bit because then I put up Brogan's episode. Oh, right. Which was the other week, so. Yes. And that was of, when he first kind of broached the subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through yeah. the gauntlet But then down. that little video that, that he uh, texted me today that I sent you, there's a clip in there where he's like, He's like, send me school nights yes. info. I'm yes. gonna that guy's I'm gonna be friends with that guy. <laughs> you know? He's just a big cuddly so, friend hunter. Mad love for Brogan. Yes. But for all of you out there in pod, in the podcast universe, Adam's job is secure here. 
My love for Adam runs deep. Thank you, sir. Nobody's taken that chair away from you. Although we may have Brogan come out. And in that case, perhaps we should do a plant-based leather couch intervention situation. We could get a therapist involved. We can talk it all through. Yeah, I would love that. Come to some- I have a lot to say. Place of love and consensus over the whole thing. I'm just glad that my groundswell of supporters out there um, it's growing. They, it's growing, and they gathered there with pitchforks and and torches, yeah. just like I came suggested. to your defense, right? Stridently. I had nothing to do with that, Rich. <laughs> yeah, you weren't using Fiverr to like. Pay, <laughs> we were on. Pay we have a group on Parlor. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we've cleared that up, right? Yes, we're all good. Yes. Um, what else do we want to talk about? We should we should kind well, of you, shift you're, gears you're a little ta- bit. You have to talk about what you've been doing because I oh. know that you're in a different phase than you're than you've been in for a while. Yeah, I mean we're gonna we're gonna get into that. I think in the the bigger theme okay. after after the ad break, I've been I've been writing. Um, I've been kind of in the down the rabbit hole yeah. with that, and it's been fairly all consuming in a good way, but not without its drawbacks. So we'll talk about that after the break. I think Fair I think enough. we should get into uh, two um, noteworthy, newsworthy topics. The first is yep. this ultra race uh, tragedy in China mm-hmm. that happened, um, well, I found out about it on Sunday morning. It mm-hmm. must've happened on Saturday where extreme weather killed 21 ultra marathoners Crazy. in this race. Blake, can you pull up? That first article about this, the Yellow River Stone Forest Hundred K, yeah. I believe, what it's called, a hundred kilometer in Gansu Province race. Have you been to that part of the world? I'm not familiar um, with what just, the terrain you know, is. My only experience in mainland China is Beijing and just outside at the Great Wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So scroll up a little bit. I believe that in the early miles of this race, they were uh, Blake. Scroll up so I can read the article. I mean, scroll down. Um, they were faced with 6,300 feet of elevation gain, or I don't know where, what elevation gain they started at, but essentially these runners were all in shorts mm-hmm. and Lycra and just the lightest gear. And in short shrift, the weather turned pretty dire, pretty quickly, such that uh, a lot of these participants got caught in a rainstorm that turned into a hailstorm. Temperatures dropped precipitously, and really bad winds. And it became heavy incredibly winds. dangerous, and yeah. these people were trapped. They couldn't get their footing. The terrain was super rugged. Apparently, it was already scrambling kind of terrain. Like people were on their hands and knees and right. still getting blown over. Yeah, yeah. Um, Twenty-one people out of one hundred and seventy-two. I mean, that's got to be the biggest death toll in the history of multi-sport. I, I, I don't know of any other event where that many people perished. How, I mean, could, how, crazy. how could it be more than that? Yeah. You know, like, in, like, cause it takes a tragedy. Apparently several others could have died, but like they huddled in, in caves or that like one, one guy in the top six of the runners, the only one to survive he thinks was carried by a shepherd he blacked out on the mountain mm. and was carried by a shepherd down to a cave and yeah. a fire was started. And then others joined him in there. Others went down the hill um, and into, into, you know, I guess structures that rescuers sent them into. It, apparently the winds were tearing through the space blankets. It was that bad. Yeah. And so people had space blankets. It's not like that these people were all kind of super green or underprepared. People had space blankets. They mm. might not have had the technical gear you needed, but they had that mm-hmm. and it didn't work. Yeah, and that one particular athlete that was saved by the the shepherd, I think passed out and came yep. to in a cave, right? right Didn't right, even right. know what had happened. Didn't know he got carried down there. Right. Guy saved his life. There was one guy who who perished, I think his name is Liang, Liang Jing. Yeah. I'm sure I'm butchering that name, who was a champion ultra runner. Like there was a field a of guy. you know, really fast people. I'm yep. sure it was a wide spectrum of of talent and ability, but the fact that that many people died, I know it was a huge story all across China. Mm-hmm. There's gonna be, I'm sure, a massive investigation into this. And I think, you know, what's instructive about it is, is a conversation around the safety measures when you host an event like this. And I think in particular, ultra running or ultra trail running being this sport that is growing very rapidly. It's still an emergent sport, but it's gone from its kind of 
you know, grassroots, uh, dirt bag, hippie, you know, sleep in a tent at the starting line vibe to legitimate, you know, a legitimate sport that's attracting more and more people. And I think with that comes a responsibility to have your shit together for something like this. It seems like the race should just have been called off because yeah. like with weather coming in in altitude. I can't imagine they didn't know that there was a solid chance that the weather would turn in such a way. Maybe they didn't, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't seem, it seems like that that would be where you'd start the investigation. In terms of the rescue, 1200 people turned out and combed right. those mountains in, in really bad conditions um, for look, searching for people and they rescued a lot of them. I mean, it could have mm -hmm. been a lot worse. I mean, yeah. so kudos to the rescue search and rescue team, which I've always admired search and rescue people, mm -hmm. um, but 1200 people getting out there to help out is quite a number. Right, but that's yeah. reactive safety as opposed to prophylactic safety. Yeah, that's government versus so. the organizers. Yeah, I would imagine that all race organizers are gonna think twice now. And it's gonna mean that that uh, race organizers are gonna have to have that, those prophylactic safety measures in place if the terrain is such that it could lead to something like this, which means the races are gonna be more costly. Right. And you know, it's, it's, Insurance. it's just a, I think it's a shifting of the tide as this sport grapples with how it's gonna mature and grow. But it makes me think about <laughs> the Otillo race in Sweden when sure. we're doing the pig swim and the boats are getting thrashed around. I was like, this is crazy. Like this would never have been allowed to continue in the United States. Even Catalina, people come in, come in from the long distance. You, you, I think you just came out for the one day, but if you'd stayed the second day. It was day, so calm that day. Yeah, but the second day wasn't. It, winds were howling, the water temp dropped a bit and it, they're out there longer. And the, the last third of the race is mostly swim with just little runs connecting mm -hmm. the swims. And so there's not enough of a run to get you warm. And I think it's similar to the, how the race ends, or no, maybe, I don't, maybe not, I don't know, but that's how the race ended there. And um, people came in, I was, I was concerned about several people who came in completely shivering, blue lips, the mm. whole thing. Um, luckily there was warm showers right there and they could take care of it, Yeah, but, uh, you it know. is a little bit different than extreme altitude and extreme weather. The altitude yeah. is, I think the altitude with the ice yeah. weather. And then uh, people were apparently, some of these runners were foaming at the mouth. Like, so how fast right. did the, did did you get to, you know, pulmonary edema? Like mm. how fast that happens? So tragic, it's tragic. 21 people, it's crazy. It's crazy. So heartbroken for, uh, all of these people and their families, of course, who are suffering as a result of this, and for China's trail running community in general, it's just an awful tragedy. Well, that's the, what they're saying about the Hong Kong ultra marathon community is like really staggered by this. They've all sure. lost lots of friends. I'm sure. Yeah, it can't be that big of a community, right? You know, so and there were people interviewed in the piece, like, "Oh, this was my friend," or "I lost two friends." Like everybody who's Part of that subculture, I'm sure, is you know one or two people away from being connected to somebody who who passed. When you did some ultras, were you uh, always careful to check the weather yourself and and make sure that you were carrying like heavy gear for cold or? or well, like I'm not. You know, I, I'm not going to hold myself out as a super experienced ultra runner. Like I haven't done these kinds of races. Like I've done Ultraman where you have a crew following right. you the whole time. Like right. you're being monitored constantly is very different. Plus it was in Hawaii, right. you know, it's just, it's not the same thing. No, I mean, the biggest threat there is being hit by a car or getting attacked by jellyfish. Right. But you're not gonna die of hypothermia. No, you no, know, no. In, uh, in Hawaii, so. Mm -hmm. All right, well let's let's uh, let's switch gears here a little bit. Yep. I think it's time to check in on the Iron Cowboy with our Iron Cowboy moment, our Let's ticker. Do it. He's on day 85 Unbelievable. now. Unbelievable. It's so crazy. I can't even believe it. Day 85 and he actually looks great. I feel like he's he, in a new gear. He's I keep in better saying shape. that. He's in better shape now than when, like day yeah. 20. Yeah. Yeah. So today's Monday, he's on day 85. This will go up Thursday. So anything could happen between now and then. But yesterday, day 84, he said he felt better than he had in the last three weeks. Mm -hmm. He seems to be ending the marathon every day in daylight, yep. which is unbelievable, um, which means he's getting more rest. He's allowing his body a little bit more time to recover, which is cool. His spirits are very high. Like he just seems super engaged with, with his uh, 
with his community, and all the people that are there to support. I just, I love seeing his little speeches at the end of the night after Fantastic. he finishes the marathon. He's yeah. so gracious with the people who've traveled all over, you know, to come and, and run or, or bike with him. It's very cool. Jesse Itzler dropped yep. in on him the other day. Yep. Jesse posted, I think it was yesterday or today, uh, that the one of the biggest things that he took away from it was just how, uh, how much his family is a part of this. Like the mm. fact that his his wife is basically running the whole thing, his kids, his daughter's running the social media. He's got his son out there with him. Like the whole family is involved. And then he's got his wingman. He's got this other, you know, sort of outer, more outer, you know, in the concentric circle of support of people that are helping him. And he's he's a leader. Like he's able to like engender the level of like support and love uh, from all of these people who are devoting their time. Mm. I mean, his whole family is basically all about it right now. It's crazy. And he takes calls on the marathon. Mm. I know, yeah. He <laughs> but does. he, he uh, his his daughter is, is well also not just social media, she's handling like the media relations as well. She is, yes. right. Yeah. And sponsor relationships. Yeah. Like yeah. it's it's a, like a full-time she's 18, job I'm that she's sure. doing. Right, yeah. I know, Yeah, I know. It's pretty cool. It's amazing. So are you gonna go out there? Yes, uh, I'll be there the last few days of the- You are. Yes. Um, my goal is to be there the last mm. part of the last, the third to last day and then the last full days, the last two days. Pretty exciting. Um, yeah. So you there. can do multiple Ironmans, right? I am, my goal is, <laughs> you know, a part of my job is gonna be to like chronicle his experience and everything, but all, the other part of it is to is to kind of take note of the community response mm-hmm. and how people are just turning out and the and kind of the that that herd of support um which is super inspiring to see the Forrest Gump effect right is what we're trying with what we're calling it mm-hmm. um and so I'll be taking that temperature as well so that's going to include uh finishing at least one of the marathons with them which I feel like I've never even run more than 11 miles at once but this right. is like a run walk and I've walked you know, I've walked 26 miles in a day, a couple of different times. Sure. So, and I'm I'm in good shape for it. So, I, I think I'll be maybe the last one mm-hmm. uh, is mm-hmm. what I'll shoot for. But we'll see. So he's scheduled to finish on June 8th. Yes. If all goes to plan, correct? Yes. yes. I got to see what I can do. I got to get you out there. Can't make any promises. I'm juggling a lot of responsibilities <laughs> with a lot of different people right now I in know. my household. I know. Um, I'm definitely gonna make a point of trying to get out there. I don't know that I can be out there on the final day, but I know if I don't find a way to do that, I'll be super bombed. <laughs> Bring the whole Life family, that's one way of doing it. That's, I can tell you, I can promise you that's not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is not gonna happen. Pile in, rent a minivan, but, Rich. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't wanna publicly say, uh, make any promises that I can't live up to, but I'm, I'm looking into it. So Fantastic. we'll see what happens, but much love to, the Iron Cowboy and his whole family. It's just, it's so impressive what he's doing. It's, it's unbelievable. Amazing. And the fact that his body is acclimating to this and holding up and just yeah. remarkable. And you talk to him on the phone and he's like, it's like he's sitting at a desk or like sitting you, on his did couch. Did you speak to him on the phone? I've spoken to him oh, twice did? now. Cool. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. And he's uh-huh. just like so inspired and inspired. Yeah. He posted the other day, maybe it was yesterday, I can't remember. It was like something like someone asked him, how do you know if you're gonna get through a given day? He says, I know it the minute I set my foot in the water or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like he already knows, like he Did wakes you see, up knowing. It must've been day 80, maybe 82 or 83, right before he was about to get into the pool. Cause he never, he never posts any videos until the swim's over. Right. But he was struggling to get his head around beginning another day. And he teared up, like he got emotional and he's like, he started crying and he was like, I'm gonna try. I'm just going to, I'm going to try. And that was it. Like you could tell the exhaustion level was just beyond hmm. imaginable. I did not know about that. Day 82, 83. I think it was, might've been day 83. Yeah, it's weird because if you're, the Instagram stories disappear, yeah. right? So yeah. if you're not on it, you miss it. But um, I would certainly ask him about that. It, it appeared to be, you know, who knows what he's also not sharing, but it appeared to be quite a low moment for him. And then to see him rally back and then a day or two later, big smile, lots of energy. And I've never once seen him short or curt with anyone. He's nothing but like gracious. Every word that comes out of his mouth is positive. Mm. 
And, you know, there's a, there's a powerful lesson in that for all of us. I no think. doubt, man, no doubt. So sending you love and strength. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back with the big theme. The big theme. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly. And because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. Adam took two drinks of his water during the break. He didn't want anyone to see or I hear, gasped, but I it gasped. happened, right? Are we? Are you okay? Don't make me <laughs> sick my minions upon you. Yeah, that Fiverr account. You better. You better put a little more money in there. Um, you know, it is true. I am de- slightly dehydrated, Rich. Mm. Well, all those Secret Service duties. I might have been heavy on the salt in last night's dinner. Mm. That plus the Secret Service duties. Plus the but news not, cycle. Not about the swim run training where you're swallowing salt water off Point Doom. You know what? I've been training in uh back to swim in the run. Bay. We can't we can't stop talking about swim run. Well, swimming in general. Yeah. So I've been Nicholas has been trying to get get me to do drills with swimming, and I have always not done it. But the last two swims I've actually been trying to and he sends like these drills that are obviously shorthand and every swimmer who's been ever swam right. like in at, from ten, age 10 on but knows you need what you're talking about. But you decoder ring. But you should just no send them to me, I'll decode it for you. So anyway, I'm kind of trying to figure it out, but I was out there swimming and was surrounded by dolphins and had wow. such a great time. And, uh, and great like whites, it. you just didn't see them. I know, but that's okay. Right. I felt good, but there was one really murky area right after the dolphin area. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> not so good. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, the big theme that we're going to talk about today big has theme. to do with balance, mm. which is a subject that's come up many times in the history of this podcast, the idea of living a balanced life or living your life in pursuit of balance. And I want to talk about this in the context of what I'm grappling with right now. As we mentioned prior to the break, um, I've been writing, I've been on a writing jack lately. I'm, I'm working on putting together volume two of Voicing Change. Uh, and what's interesting about this is that this book is very much a team effort. I've got designers, I've got people who know how to do book layouts. I've got graphics people. I've got Georgia who's helping me with some of the, the writing on it. Mm-hmm. And, and you know they've been doing this for months at this point. So every two weeks we do a Zoom call. It's an update on where they're at and they're progressing like very methodically and gradually through the manuscript. And I have this guilt and shame every time I get on one of these Zoom calls because I've done nothing, <laughs> you know? And they're like, Rich, you need, we need this, this, and this from you, you gotta do it. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I just could not get off my ass and start working on this right. thing. And Greg would be like, just work on it like an hour or two a day, just chip away at it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like intellectually, rationally, that makes sense. But I just couldn't, make that happen. Mm. But now we have looming deadlines and deadlines are very effective in you know catalyzing you to, you know, get on it yep. mainly out of fear, but I've been paralyzed to just begin. Mm. But I finally cracked the seal 
a couple of weeks ago. And what happens in my experience is that when I crack that seal and I just start, suddenly I become uh, not just invested in it, but but it becomes like all consuming. Like it starts to monopolize yeah. my focus. And the only thing I wanna do is work on it. So this obsession kicks in where I then crowd out everything else in my life and just go down the rabbit hole and I just work on it for like 12 hours a day, you know, and exhaust myself. And then I wake up at three in the morning and start working it. You know, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's right. like, it's not balanced. Right away you get into that mode or does it take a, a few well, days? Well, t- there's, a, there's a little bit of a lead up, mm-hmm. you know, and then, it, and then it kicks in and it's, it's like addiction, you right. know? And I've just become a full blown addict where it's like the relief, there's a relief in, sitting back down and being engaged with it. And there's also this sense of impending greater relief that you're nearing a certain finish line. And right. there's a discomfort with not working more quickly towards that. And as a book writer, I'm sure you've experienced this, right? Yes, I, uh, I relate to this, not with basically any assignment I'm working on. The, it's, the hardest part is getting, getting yourself to actually start. You know, mm-hmm. I remember with one breath, I was terrified because I'd spent, the better part of a year researching. And I had all this research. Now it was time to, act, I had an outline. Now it was time to actually do it. And I was terrified that you know, I couldn't do it. You mm-hmm. know, I had like two and a half months to write a book. Did you have a like a, an extended period of paralysis though, before you actually? Yeah, I think I think like I could have started it. writing it while I was still researching it. But mm-hmm. I told myself, you know, no, you gotta do the research first. And mm-hmm. then, um, and you know, then I didn't, I couldn't, luckily in that situation, I couldn't afford to have the paralysis. So I've had extended periods of paralysis with the current book I'm writing with my- Well, with, deadlines yeah. will, will cure you of right. the supposed writer's block there was that no, we like to indulge in. <laughs> there, was right? no ch- there was no chance of paralysis yeah. for that. So I, I just dove in, but, the, but what you're talking about is the pressure is on you and you feel the pressure. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as you start, especially in a writing process, I find, you get some ease right away. Yeah. You feel like, okay, I can now see myself. If I just do that again, mm-hmm. I can I can get to the end. And then once you're- Well, it's like a half, locomotive. Right. You know, the first part is so slow. Right. And then you hit a certain inflection point where you're like, okay, right. I, I, I feel downhill. like I know what I'm doing. I wouldn't say downhill, but you hit a stride. Yeah, and you, you get know? the momentum and that carries yeah. you. And then, yeah. Momentum is so powerful. Yeah. It's such a self-perpetuating energy source. It's so difficult to covet. But once you have it, I feel like it's so important to protect it against everything else because it's fleeting. Like if the if that momentum gets drained somehow, I just know all too well how difficult it is to get back into that state where you can allow the momentum to propel you forward. Yeah. It takes it takes consistency to get back to the momentum. Because mm-hmm. if you if you're if you have it going, then you have to take a break, then it's gonna take a couple of days for you to get back into the yeah. groove. So this process for me always, always uh, connects me with like guilt and shame. Mm. Cause I feel like, why can't I just work on it responsibly an hour or two a day? Then I would be in lockstep with my team who has been doing that all along rather than trying to play catch up, which makes me feel even guiltier. But I've learned, Julie's always like, it's cause you love it this way. You love it. Don't complain. You're not allowed to complain about this because you always do this. <laughs> right, you know? right, like right. there's some part of you that likes it or um, gets something out of it, right? Even if it's a, an unhealthy habit, it's still doing something for me, which well, is the, why I keep doing it. The procrastination creates pressure and the pressure creates better work. Yeah. So the way I rationalize it yeah. is this is how this is what I need to do to do my best work. Like I can't just pop in and out because it's in hour six that things really start to come together. And it's that experience of immersion where you're just totally all in and the rest of the world disappears that you put yourself in the position for that like extra piece to come out. I think there's something to that. I don't think it's a hard and fast rule, but I think it's something to that. Like if you're really, under the gun, that's when, and you're you're living and breathing it. There's no separation. Mm-hmm. Certainly, you can have some great moments of inspiration, but you can also have them on a walk in in the middle of that kind of experience. Okay, I'm gonna take a walk. I'm gonna go outside and catch my breath, and then it comes to you. 
So I don't, I've a long while ago, I kind of stopped trying to figure out what the perfect conditions are for writing or what the, you know, the best place to do it or how to do it or this process or that process. You just have to do it in whatever way you can get to it. Um, the fact that this is your process now is great. And, you know, Rob Bell says, uh, every project will demand maybe a slightly different process mm -hmm. from him. And, but I look at him yeah. and this is total projection, yeah. but it just appears that it flows effort, effortlessly <laughs> like out of that guy. Cause he's such a constant font of right. creative output. And I have, you know, this unhealthy thing, which is if it doesn't hurt, then you didn't push yourself hard enough and it could have been better, mm. which is at odds with this idea that I've tried to embrace, but have been unable to master, which is what if it were easy, right? Like what if it, what if it just flowed? Like what if it were easy? What if you let go of that story that revolves around the grind and what comes out of the grind and you just allowed yourself to be in a space where it just, it just comes because you're in the allowing rather than in the forcing. Interesting. And, and that's the mountain that I've tried to climb and I'm, I'm still at the base of that mountain, I would say. Well, but I, I have had, go ahead, sorry. No, no, please. I also get accused of interrupting you too much. So I, I think I interrupt you constantly. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I've interrupted people my entire career. I, I, at the beginning, <laughs> yeah. it was really bad. I'd listen to the interview tapes and I'd, and I'd cringe at myself. It's gotten mm -hmm. a little better, but I do it to you as well. But I, all I was gonna suggest was, that uh, if you look at sports or if you look at how you got better at a certain thing in, in athletics, has it ever been through just easing up? No, and that's the lens right. that I use right. because right. you know my narrative is everything that I've been able to accomplish is a result of me being willing to outgrind everybody else and work harder. Right. It's not a talent thing. It's a it's a it's a grit thing. Right. And so that's my default but I'm not so sure that that is the healthiest and it's certainly not the most sustainable because it's exhausting. Right. So I go, I, I do these mad sprints and then I'm depleted and then I need to recover right. as opposed to what I would imagine or what I project onto Rob Bell, which is that he's just consistently, you know, creating all the time. And I'm not saying it's effortless for him, but he would appear to have a healthier relationship with his, you know, inner muse such that He's not like he doesn't hold himself out as somebody who gets exhausted because he's no. Creating, I think it's easier to be you know? prolific if you're doing a little bit at a time every day, sure. like like the Hemingway thing from six a.m. to noon, and then he's at the bar, right. you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I think Ryan Holiday does a good job of that too. Right. Like yeah. he talks a lot about that. Like he's just constructed his life so that these are the hours that he does the thing, and you know he does it no matter what. It's a Stephen Pressfield approach right. to the whole thing, right? And I I really aspire to master that, I have a lot of other moving pieces in my life at the same time. Of when course. I wrote Finding Ultra, it was different. That was the only thing that was happening, but right. now there's a lot going on. And so figuring out how to squeeze that in while these other things are still you know, on track has been the challenge for me. But one thing that I have done is try to be a little bit more gentle on myself and rather than indulge in that guilt or that shame, like, why can't I do it that way? Why do I always set myself up for this? And why am I putting myself in this position? But to just kind of let go of that and say, look, for whatever reason, this is my predisposition. This is how I'm wired. And at least for right now, I'm going to embrace that aspect of me and let go of trying to judge myself against some imaginary standard of what a balanced person's life looks like. And I think, the reason that I wanted to bring this up today isn't to like talk about my personal experience, but as an instructive kind of uh, launch pad to talk about something that I think is very common with a lot of people, which is this idea of living a balanced life. What does it mean to pursue a life of balance? And is that something that we should even aspire to do? Right, what do you think? I don't know, well, I think, I think that, that that sets people up for failure. And I think most people, have some version of what I experience, which is a sense that they can't live up to that. They have this idea, they look out into the world and they see person X who seems to be excelling in their life in all categories. And they say, how can I you know, be, be, a, be a great mom and be a you know, professional at my job and make sure that there's food on the table and also you know, go to the PTA meetings and you know, right. all, the, all the stuff, right? right. Like, and it sets up an unrealistic, uh, 
set of parameters or expectations for the average person. So my whole thing is letting go of that and focusing not on how you can be balanced on an everyday basis in all the things that you're trying to do better at, but rather focus on the thing that you are doing in the moment and be the best version of yourself that you can in that moment. And understand that nobody can do everything every single day well. So it's more like a toggle switch of being invested in what you're doing in the moment and then switching gears to the next thing. Like I can't, you know, first of all, multitasking is a misnomer. There's no such thing as multitasking, but we still have this idea that we can like switch gears and go back and forth from other things. And some people are better at that than others. And I've learned that I'm not good at that. I'm good at doing one thing well, and then slowly moving to the next thing and focusing on doing that thing well. But I can't toggle switch back and forth within a single day. My wife is very good at that. Right. Greg Anzalone is very good at that. Right. It's a different set of skills. So it's about understanding what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, and then trying to orient your life around addressing those rather than guilting yourself into why you can't do it like somebody else is doing it. Maybe that's your balance. Mm. Your balance is I do one thing at a time really well. And that's how you feel the most balanced. Like, what does it even mean to be balanced? Does it mean that you can do X, Y, and Z at this incredibly high level? Cause mm -hmm. that doesn't seem balanced to me. That just seems like a great aptitude for work. Well, how are we measuring balance? Right. And what is the time frame? And one of the things I'm always talking about is expanding, your, expanding the window upon which you're evaluating your ability to to live a balanced life. There if you're you looking at on it, if you're looking at it through the microscope of 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 you know your daily routine, most people are going to fall short of that. I I fail miserably at that. But if you look at it over a long continuum, then you're giving yourself larger bandwidth to say, okay, I'm doing this one thing now, but what are the other things in my life that are important that are not getting as much attention as they should? When I finish this, then I got to make sure that those things are in order. And in the background hum, you know, the other things that are important need a little bit of daily nourishment, but perhaps aren't going to be getting your full attention, but then understanding like, okay, when that's done, then I need to reconfigure my life to focus on these other things. So over the course of several months or a year, then it looks like it's in balance. Right. But when you look at it on a, like if you look at my life on a day-to-day -day basis, it's completely out of balance. So Brad Stolberg, the other week we talked about Steve Magnus. Mm -hmm. We used his kind of quote and something that he had written as a topic uh, for for discussion, um, Steve Steve's writing partner is Brad Stolberg, who's also been on the podcast, New York Times contributor, um, Outside Magazine contributor. Have yep. you ever met Brad? I have not. You'd like him; he's great. But he's written extensively about this subject, and one of the things that 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 he said is that a lot of people swallow this cultural message of balance, balance, balance. Then they struggle to find it and they get down on themselves because they can't do everything every single day. They think I'm gonna wake up, I'm gonna have some family time. I'm gonna work, I'm gonna go to work from nine to five. I'm gonna come home, more family time, cook dinner, watch a TV show, go to sleep. But that's only one way to think about balance. Mm. And this is where I really resonate with Brad. He says, try thinking about balance being over a long continuum. This gives you permission to go all in for periods of time. That way you can experience flow and still have a balanced life. It's just that the balance might be over five or 10 years, not every single day. And a corollary to that is this idea that rather than striving for balance, striving for self-awareness instead, the ability to know your core values and evaluate the trade-offs inherent in pursuing them. And I love that. It's also the subject of a New York Times piece that he wrote mm -hmm. called, maybe we all need a little less balance. Someone's Hot quoted take. in there. Someone is quoted in there. I know. I you know, I pulled that article up. I'd forgotten that he referenced me in it. Um, <laughs> it's not why I'm bringing it up, but <laughs> I just think it's a great read for helping people recalibrate how you think about these things. And despite the fact that I've been, you know, droning on and on about this for a long time, I found myself in the process of yeah. working on this book project to go right back to that level of self-judgment that's counterproductive rather than just saying this is what I'm doing now for whatever reason, here I am back again, doing this thing I said I wasn't gonna do again, which yeah. is you know, going down the rabbit hole and, and blocking out everything else and not doing it in a, you know, 
a more managerial kind of way, but this is the way that I do it and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, they, I'm, I'm totally with that. I think like this idea of balance, this idea of finding your passion and following your passion or finding the one, these are all somewhat cultural myths to some mm -hmm. extent. And to me, we are here on earth to find ourselves first. And that requires some self-reliance and independence, but it also requires some mutual dependence and interconnection. And it's all, a, it's all this like equation that we're trying to find the answer to. I mean, equanimity, is kind of like a corollary to enlightenment, right? When you find like the, when the, when the person, the bodhisattvas in meditation to achieve equanimity is mm -hmm. to achieve enlightenment. Well, like, what does equanimity mean? Right. It means no one achieves it in their day to day life. Right. You know, and so yes, it, in terms of how do you get the best conditions for you to feel comfortable in your skin, comfortable in your life, having your family do well, having your career do well, all that 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 balance sheet. It seemed to me we're talking like life's balance sheet. Um, and and it's like, that's a moving, uh, those graphs are like mm -hmm. jumping up and down. And I think when it comes to writing, two things come to mind. Number one is you just have to get the work done and you have to live with those, you know, critics, like the, guy, the hecklers from the Muppet show in your head mm -hmm. that are gonna constantly be jabbering and not to, date myself, but constantly jabbering in your head about what you're doing and the way you're doing it. The two old guys the up there. The two old guys yeah. up there, <laughs> tune out the boomers in your head. Yeah. And and you just have to, you just have to, you know, surrender to the process and the process is going to be uncomfortable a lot of the time. The idea of flow state and athletics, I think you can find it and you can find it in writing. I have found it in writing mm -hmm. where I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And I feel like all, in, I feel the flow, but just because the 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 experience feels good though doesn't mean the work will turn out right like to be good yeah that's I, the illusion right yeah you think oh it's it's going good it's going right. good but then no back to the drawing board and sometimes pick it up another day and look at it right and sometimes you bleed the words mm -hmm. every word costs like a pint of flesh right. or something and then you go back to read it and you're like wow that was really good you hated the day mm -hmm. it felt miserable um, when so, that happens to me though that just affirms that story that pain is the driver of quality. Right. You know, which is not a healthy. No. Thing. So I think whether you're feeling doubt about a project or feeling good about the project, the key is to turn tune both those things out to get the project done. That's my only experience mm -hmm. of it and it's something that I I struggle with every day. Like last week I was the one complaining about my writing right. process. It's not comfortable. It's yeah. not it's not necessarily always a fun job. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doing it now with a newborn. Like you have right. a, a new set of challenging, complicated variables that you didn't have to deal with before. It's true, it's true. But at the same time, I have more time to actually every day go and do a thing because mm -hmm. I haven't been on the road. Right. And so, um, but that hasn't led to me being super prolific right. yet. But, well, I like that idea yeah. that Brad talks about with self-awareness and I think it's yes. related to the piece you were speaking about with respect to equanimity, Yeah. you know, like, be the most present and self-aware that you possibly can when you're in the midst of doing the one thing that you're doing. You know, and beautiful. that idea of equanimity made me think of that, I don't know who said it, that quote that um, nature is never in a hurry, but everything always gets done. Mm. And I think about that and I'm like, I'm always in a hurry. And right. most of the stuff I'm trying to do doesn't get done. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't you know. I, but looking at your Which life, I would find that you know, to be completely I know, untrue. But like that's the that's the story. <laughs> I'm like, why didn't I do that? I didn't get anything right. done today. You know, it's that's the that's the self defeating, um, looping you know thought pattern that's going on in my mind. Right. That if I don't make the time to meditate and you know practice those mindfulness things that are so annoying, like that gets the best of me. You definitely feel it, like when when I don't do that, those little pieces like the, you know, I'm not really having time to meditate too much, but I have like an affirmation with Zuma every morning after yoga, if I get to yoga, uh -huh. if I can do it. So it's like, you know, you're right. If you if you can start off and hit, hit, hit the first things that you know are good for you, then maybe you have a chance at yeah, fighting back You're, you're taking day. out an insurance policy on having a better day, Yeah, you know? Um, but this idea of balance though, like you're saying, um, I think the whole inspiration for you, right? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, is it's okay to uh, to tackle this book that way. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it might just be 
the way you are now, rich roll this version of yourself, that's your nature right now. Doesn't it's mean that will be nature. your nature forever. It's definitely my nature. Yeah. And the idea is for me, I think to be in self acceptance of that, mm. but also not do it in a self-destructive addictive way, like to get the best out of my ability to immerse myself in a project and be focused without the kind of downside aspects of it that I think are, you know, a relic of, you know, a history of, of alcoholism right. that I think comes into play. I think about that when I'm out riding my bike up PCH and I see the surfers out there or somebody out swimming and I'm like, I should be swimming. I should be surfing. And I can guarantee you if I was surfing, I'd see a cyclist and I'd be like, I really should be on my bike right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Like there's all it's not a grass is greener thing. It's more like no. wanting to do everything simultaneously well, all the time and and just being present for what you're doing in the moment. It's like living at the intersection of YOLO and FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You don't want to be there. How do those two <laughs> intersect in the Venn diagram? <laughs> That'll be next week. Well, the roll more on. YOLO, the less FOMO, right? Right, but yet what you're saying is you have FOMO for the YOLO you're not doing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> because there's all yeah, there's always something else that you're missing out on. There's multiple YOLOs. Right. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're in, <laughs> in the extended YOLO universe. <laughs> yes, there's 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 infinite FOMOs. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> but when you think of YOLO, you don't think of hunching over a computer and and typing a book. Although when you think of FOMO, you can definitely God. Right. That, that book. Well, is I could be out training and saying, "Oh my God!" Like. I really need to be getting on this, like right. I have anxiety because the book is not right. gonna write itself. Right, you right, know, right, That kind of thing. And these years don't come back to you. They do not, <laughs> they do not. <laughs> Did we accomplish anything productive for the listeners in talking about well, that? Well, you know what I think? I think the listener is gonna be like, wow, Rich is just as fucked up as we are. <laughs> <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> There's hope for yeah. us all. <laughs> There's hope. Um, cool, so let's do a little bit of show and tell, shall we? Let's do it. We got a little Shrimu out here on the desk mm. today. Um, and there's a reason for that. You know, I, I enjoy. I bought, here, I some. bought. Uh, oh, did you? April. Here, slide so. this over. Can you grab that? Yes. Um, the reason that I'm doing a little show and tell around it today is because uh, Shrimu has just. So, for those who are listening who don't know what I'm talking about, Shrimu is my wife's plant based cheese company. Uh, it's really remarkable stuff that she's created. There was a recent review. Somebody said, this cheese is absolutely lusty. It's a whole new cheese planet. I thought that was a great review. But anyway, I'm bringing it up because it's a subscription model. You order these cheese wheels, they're artisanal, like just next level, the next evolution of, of cheese, like the, you know, like your favorite camembert or brie, like insane. But the subscription box has traditionally been like a large box that is, uh, you know, can be pricey for certain people. So they just launched a two wheel box, which is much more affordable. The two wheel flavor options are, are Julie always has these great names, Awaken Magic, mm. which is Gold Alchemy and Elder or Awaken Heart, which is Birdie and Elder. Gold Alchemy is sort of like a smoked Gouda infused with smoke and turmeric. The Elder is like a brie uh, the birdie is like a camembert with truffle in it. They're insane. Mm. Um, but this two wheel box is is 59 bucks plus shipping for a subscription or $69 plus shipping for a one-time purchase. And they're running a special Father's Day special, which is why I'm bringing it up right now, uh, where you can get 10% off any Awaken two wheel or Devoted, which is their three wheel box or Ritual, their four wheel box if you order before or by June 11th. So the orders will ship June 14th and you use the coupon code FATHERSDAY10 at checkout. And uh, that's what you do. So Blake, can you pull this up? The website is shrimu, S-R-I-M-U dot com slash fathers dash day. And you can see the offering um, there, but it's, it's really remarkable stuff. And I just wanted to shout out uh, the Father's Day special because, you know, the hardworking, nurturing dads of the world could do with a little bit of a uh, plant-based luxury. You know, I, I purchased it, the Mother's Day special version of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a big hit, it is a big hit. Yeah, so Blake, it's srimu.com slash fathers dash day. 
should pull up right there and you can see it. It's that special URL. So Father's Day 10 at checkout for 10% off. Um, there you go. Boom. Happy Father's Day. Look at that beautiful cheese, right? This cheese is nuts. This cheese is nuts. Um, a couple other show and tell things that I wanted to do. My boy, Simon Hill mm. from the Plant Proof Podcast, his book, The Proof is in the Plants is out in Australia right now. So for anybody who's in Oz, who's listening, you should pick that up. I think it was a number one bestseller in the nonfiction fantastic. category or something like that. Like he's killing it out there. Um, also his podcast is fantastic. I talk about it all the time. If you're not um, listening to that, you should check it out. And the book is gonna be dropping in the US, I think a while ago, he said two months. So maybe in July, I'll keep you posted on that, but I'm excited for that book to be available here in the US. Simon really knows his stuff. He also has a really great affect in terms of talking about nutrition and navigating the peccadilloes of the you know online nutrition wars uh, in terms of his plant-based advocacy. He's just, mm. he's a beautiful guy. He's ripped, he's fantastic. He's got a great restaurant in Bondi called Eden, mm. Eden Bondi. So if you haven't eaten there, next time you find yourself in Bondi, you I know. to go to Eden. Dude, I might find myself there soon because someone's got a passport. That's right. The baby got a oh, passport. Oh, you got, you got an Australian passport. No, we got a US passport for the baby. For the baby. Oh, yeah. a US passport for the baby. <laughs> yeah. Who was I talking to though? Somebody was telling me they just got an Australian passport. We're, we're headed um, in that direction. You gotta, yeah. you have to, you know, he had to get his passport first and then mm -hmm. he'll be the first to get residency if he wanted or right. get a passport if he wants. And then can you get a passport and Then I can Australia? go through the process too. But I think, wow. for, I don't know if I'll get a passport. I'll, I can get residency. I don't think mm. I can get a passport. Mm -hmm. No. Interesting. Yeah. Should we talk about the spirited man? Let's talk about the Did you spirited check this man. out? I did. I watched all the way through. How many of them did you watch? Blake pulled out. YouTube I watched channel. all the way through um, the uh, fourth turning. You did? Yeah. The fourth turning was good. Yeah. The fourth turning has 800 something thousand yeah. views. That's the one. So the Spirited Man is a relatively brand new YouTube channel and video series courtesy of Van Neistat, um, who is the older brother of Casey Neistat, yes. the OG in the YouTube space. Um, Casey and Van started out together before YouTube even existed. These guys were making videos together. They both had a tenure with Tom Sachs, the fine artist. Um, you can see uh, both of the Neistat brothers aesthetic reflected in, in um, what Tom Sachs does. Mm. And it's interesting, you know, Van is, you know, I've known Casey for years. He's been on the podcast a bunch of times. Like he was on before he even became, like he was a YouTuber, but before he was a vlogger, right. like it's been a long time. We should have Casey back on, but I didn't know anything about Van. And then out of the blue, Van launches this YouTube channel, I think like six or seven weeks ago, he's already got 380,000 subscribers. It's a series called The Spirited Man. Each video is its own short story, standalone curio, like art pieces. They're yeah. Beautifully rendered, yes. well thought out, uh, philosophical, you know, reflections yes. on the human condition, essentially. Yes, and I and just his particular love it. spirited man. His, yes, exactly. His, his, man. his his own spirited man journey. Yes, um, they are so unique and original, and I think that is in part because this is a guy who's not on social media. I don't think he's a guy who watches YouTube. Like right. he's coming to the platform with his own sensibility that's uncorrupted by everything else that we kind of scroll and see every single day. Yeah. So there's a purity to it that's really beautiful. And I think is lending itself to this skyrocketing popularity. I mean, in no time, this guy's like made an imprint on YouTube and I'm excited to see where this goes. Everybody should check it out. Um, the Spirited Man on YouTube. Yeah, I YouTube. got through, are you spirited actually, now that I'm looking at Are you spirited? Yeah. yeah so. Um, and he's coming on the podcast on Wednesday. Fantastic! So, you get to even yeah. I'm going to break it. I'm going to break it down with him. Uh, a couple did you watch the one on run, the Does Running Suck? Did I did you watch not. That one? I don't need to know. <laughs> I, I know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but actually, now that I'm doing Zone Two, I actually quite like it. You do. Yeah. Right. Um, but one thing that he, I got out of it was the reward for good work is more work. 
which right. I love that. Yeah. That, that phrase. And, uh, and the, the episode on the fourth turning is very interesting. It, it kind of speaks to the moment in time we are, we're mm-hmm. having right now. Mm-hmm. Ba- he's basically does a, it's a book report. Right. <laughs> he simplifies an right. argument without you having to read the book. Right. But, um, but what I like about it is he, he, he goes for depth. He goes for- It's all about that. It's all about like what's, what's bubbling beneath all of this madness that we have mm-hmm. to contend with. Mm-hmm. And within himself, which you can tell there's kind of like that simmering uh, of not discontent, but just like, like what does it all mean kind of thing. But yeah. that, with that sometimes comes like a discontent with the way, with, you know, and trying to figure out, he talks a lot about repair, he's a fix it. Yeah, so there's a there's you know. a old soul kind yeah. of you know out of step with time yeah. aspect of him yeah. because he wants to fix everything and yeah. we live in a disposable culture. Yeah. So what does it mean to be a repairman right. in the in the vernacular of the fourth turning, right? As a as a as a Gen Z guy who's very good at repairing things when the the kind of call to repair is is an antiquated concept. In a way, although I wouldn't say this cause he's not like getting into mindfulness or anything, excuse me, sorry. Um, he's not getting into mindful, mindfulness at all um, specifically yet. But one thing that came to mind is it's almost like the, the new version of Zen and the art of motor, motorcycle maintenance, but mm-hmm. as a YouTube series, because well, he's getting into like the, 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 the whole nature of repair and the fact that he's called to do that and 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 why that's important to him it, it, nothing's on the nose but in a way like you you, you get his world view on it mm-hmm. in a way that reminds me of that book but i haven't read that book in a long time but it comes to mind well he he uh in in the fourth turning video uh you see when it, when he's stacking the books yeah. and you see all those books yeah. there was one book that's called the soul of repair yes, or something yes, like that. I yeah. forget what the name of it is, yeah. but it's kind of a Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance type of book. Yes, I think it's more like a manual, but I saw an interview with Van and he said in that book, there is a passage in which it talks about the spirited man. It uses that Right, no, he says that in that video, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So that became you know the concept upon which he built this. He's like the yeah. spirited man, what would the spirited man do? And it's all in the third person. He's like this spirited man, yeah. you know, the spirited man or the spirited woman. <laughs> but you know, when you talk about a spirited horse, it's usually someone that's like, hey, what? You know, no. the, the horse is like nudging the other horse but, or whatever. But yeah. the connotation that I read into that is, is somebody who, who is out of step with yeah. the typical culture, right? right? Like he's seeing things other people aren't seeing. Yes. Like the whole thing with like fixing the dishwasher and fixing yes. the, you know, the Toyota, you know, th- grill, it's like, the universe is not correct in this, and I must correct it, yeah. or I can't rest easy. Or he can't. And this move is on. the this yeah. is the compulsion of the spirited man, which I love it, and yeah. so I'm all for it. I think it's an amazing. Thank you for turning me on to yeah. it. I'll be watching them all. It's cool. So yeah. we have that conversation coming up to look forward to. In the meantime, check it out and subscribe. Um, what do you got there? I just wanted to show you this new contraption I got. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. You you came in and you said, I have a special show and tell. Should I surprise you or, or show you now? And I was like, surprising you, but I think I already know what it is. <laughs> this particular spirited man swims in a mask. You do. Um, For those on audio only, you just yes. donned a, a diving mask that looks yes. like it came from a different era. It, I'm, I am a man out of step with my time. <laughs> you are. The spirited man is not a fan of swimming goggles. <laughs> the spirited man uses a mask because thereby he can decide at one moment to dive instead of swim. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What is, is that it. particular model of spirited mask? Would you like a mask? warranty for this mask? Because it comes know. with one. Aqualung. Aqualung. Right. Uh, it's the Aqualung. For your eyes. Spera. And Oddly this is enough, your replacement mask. This is what I. This is the replacement mask for the one that was lost. Uh-huh. But you see, I can breathe out. Of, I can exhale out of it my nose. It is at least a little bit more streamlined and goggle-like. That's my point. So you're was, you're this, finding some middle ground. I, I feel this, like this is diplomacy. This particular spirited man's mask <laughs> yeah. was created as an open water swim goggle replacement. No, uh-huh. I'm not kidding. And then, but swimmers scoff at masks like yeah. yourself. And so free divers had to embrace it for it to live. And it, here it is. And it's a new version. It's got racing stripes. Have you noticed that? I haven't, no, yeah. I can't see that far. 
anyway. But all right, well, good man. So I will, I will relent. <laughs> a detente has been achieved. <laughs> yes, Wait. in the Oslo talks. <laughs> The Oslo talks are being yeah. achieved now that the mask is is uh-huh. on the podcast. Um, I just thought the r- listeners would love to see that. It's good. The other uh, thing that I found is not to listen. It, not everyone likes biographies of long gone sports stars. I'm not going to belabor the point. I've been re- really enjoying this Duke Hanamoko um, biography. It's relatively recent. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not. It didn't come out on a big publisher. It's University of Nebraska, Nebraska Press, but it, it's and it's really uh, uh, painstakingly kind of creates his life. It's not like um, the the most compelling read for people who aren't interested in sports like that or his. But right. I, I do think that if you love water sports, Duke Hanamoko was a three time Olympian over four separate Olympiads. His peak. He would have been would have been right when World War One happened, and mm-hmm. so he didn't even get to go to his when he was his peak condition. Mm, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that it was four Olympiads. So he was 21, 22 years old in nineteen twelve, and that was his first Olympiad. And he and they competed in Antwerp, <clears throat> and it was like, <laughs> excuse me, a canal like a drainage ditch. It was mm. freezing, like the water was like they were shivering. Um, that's how, what it was like in 1912. Right. He set world records. He won the 100, he won the, the 200, I believe, and got a, um, a silver in the relay. That He went back eight years later and defended his titles, won a couple more golds, and then he won a silver um, in the, I think in the 100 in, in the third Olympiad, be, in getting like beat by Johnny West, Weissmuller. Weissmuller, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he was he was way past his prime at that point. Right, he was so in his thirties. 1916 would have been his peak. 1916 was going to be his peak, and he didn't even get to compete because mm-hmm. of you know World War One. Right, and then 1920 was in that might have been Antwerp. Yeah, 1912 was in Sweden. Excuse me. 19, 1916 was in Antwerp, and it was freezing, and it was like in this in Belgium, and it had been decimated by World War One. Mm. And so, like these, but this was the beginning, kind of really early days of Olympia. In 1912, he competed alongside Jim Thorpe, two guys. Jim Thorpe was the decathlete and the greatest right. athlete of the first 50 years of the 20th century has been declared that by basically everybody. Um, Jim Thorpe and Duke both went to schools where they were not allowed to speak their native languages. Jim Thorpe is indigenous mm-hmm. American. Indigenous, yeah. um, and Duke is full-blooded Hawaiian. Um, and so they had that connection and they were kind of really heroes to America at a time when- Massive hero. It went, it, at a time when racism was at, like off the charts. It mm-hmm. was like, the, you know, Jim Crow was just getting huge and it was the birth of the nation time and all of that. And so here these two guys come and, and capture the imagination of, of America at such a fraught time. And, and, and um, but his, he wasn't just a great, the greatest swimmer of his era. He was also the greatest surfer of yeah, his era. I know. I mean, he, he <laughs> transcended sport. He became a cultural icon he did. to this day, you know, it resonates he, all it, across the world. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. They haven't made a movie, like a movie of those two lives in tandem and parallel of Thorpe and- That's what I'm saying. And Duke together. Yeah, like, like these two guys. But then if you look at just at Duke, um, he, he got during the influenza epidemic, he got the influ- he got influenza. He did. One of the swimmers that he used to compete with early on died of it. He could have died, but an ex-girlfriend found him like at the YMCA in New York, like coughing up a lung, bleeding, and got him treatment, or maybe it was in Germany, excuse me, and saved him. Mm. And um, so he got that. There was an incident that was recalled in this book in when he was surfing in Newport Beach, because he lived here in California. Um, he was pursuing acting and he was in a bunch of films. And um, he was surfing, he camped on the beach at Corona Del Mar and it was a 20 foot day or something crazy. And a boat, they saw a boat coming in that got capsized and he went out three different times on his surfboard and he saved seven people's lives. Like maybe more, uh-huh. maybe it was like 10 people on, like pulling him on, cause his surfboards weren't like today's surfboards. They were a hundred pound yeah. plus pieces of, of wood that he carved himself and yeah. shaped himself. Um, I, you can't imagine a more- And he was a cultural icon at that time, right? It would he already be, was, It would yes. be as if Laird Hamilton was out there pulling people out of that you it's know, exactly sea. Like, that. And TMZ would be swarming and it yes. would be like a huge media event. If your life was saved by Laird Hamilton. Yeah. <laughs> 
Right. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. what it was. So anyway, um, but- I want to check that out, he, legend. He, he also had all sorts of money problems and different issues. So it's not like everything was a home run and for him. And what was ultimately Hawaii's relationship to him once he became big and like moved to the States? Well, I mean, the reason he moved to the States was because it was, so that's a good question. So what happened was he was, he did the Olympics, then he decided he'd go pro. After a while, he decided to go pro, um, but he couldn't really get a stage show off the ground swimming. And so he came back and retained his amateur status. But in the meantime, went to Hollywood to try to make movies. Mm -hmm. He was there for a period of time, came back to Hawaii and for whatever reason, they, they couldn't figure out a way to, to, you know, he couldn't figure out a, a business that he could catch on to that would be successful. He ends up like, they think they're doing him a solid, hey, come work at the city in City Hall in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And basically they have him sweeping and mopping the floors. Like he was a, like, like that's how he was treated. So then his friends in LA said, come back here. And he came back and worked and coached at the LA um, athletic club mm. and was here and worked at the beach club by the beach here. Uh, but he I does like end the up- Jonathan Club or one of those The, the beach club, in, I think. Where's that? It's right next to the Jonathan oh, Club. Okay. Yeah, but one of those two. And then he ends up back in Hawaii um, after all and runs for sheriff and becomes the sheriff of Oahu. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he became yeah. the sheriff of Oahu for years. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because in this book, they reference uh, that he's on This, this Is Your Life. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> and I went and the episode is on is on YouTube. So if you wanna have 30 minute kind of primer and see Duke and see his whole family and everything, this is your life, that old TV show. Right, from what year was this? I, like It's gotta be the 60s. 62 or, yeah, oh, that yeah, early, yeah. 50s. Maybe it's the 60s, I, I, have, to, I have, to have to look again. Mm -hmm. But the ads are hilarious. It's really funny to see old television and, and, yeah. um, and it's fun. All right, well, we'll yeah. throw that link up in the show notes. Yeah. The book Waterman is by, what's the, David what's the Davis. name? David Davis. Yeah, so I cool. think, it, I mean, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it, um, but obviously I'm, I'm, I'm mystified by this guy's story. It's just incredible. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Why hasn't there been a movie about this guy? It seems like it's like a Chariots of Fire kind of thing. Yeah, it could be, you know. I, I, it's, if you did it's, it with Thorpe. I, I think you'd want to do a Thorpe, you know, I would love to do mm -hmm. that, you know, like a, a, a a Duke and Thorpe kind of, you see them over time. Right. Thorpe ends up an alcoholic and he died in a trailer. Like, know. like, you know, you really see, one thing I'm getting from reading this is you really do see how athletes that are at their peak and really the top of, the, of their sports as young men, how hard it is for them to kind of figure out the next mm -hmm. act, mm -hmm. which we know, we've talked right. about that. Yeah, your, your life peaks at such an early age yeah. and you have the ad adulation of the world. Like, how are you gonna top that? How are you gonna find meaning in something else? Yeah. You know, it's it's like Raging Bull and Jake LaMotta when he's, you know, staring in the mirror at the end and he's all fat and he owns that bar and yeah. he's just he's just dining out on, you know, past glory. And it's also it's it's a trip to to see how Waikiki used to be and how like the estuaries were drained and all this mm. be like, you know, it's 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 also makes you kind of feel for how did we develop this way and why? Mm. And you know, we didn't know, we didn't care. Is it, is it a mixture of we didn't know we didn't care? Probably, mm. yeah. Well, the whole history of Hawaii is so fraught and- But it's not just there, disturbing. you could say the same thing, any colonized power, like in Bali right now, the main garbage dump is in the middle of the wetlands. Who put the first garbage dump in the middle of the wetlands in Bali? Most likely I would submit would be the Dutch did that when the Dutch were the colonists in, in um, Indonesia. So. You know why? Because there was no con con the people didn't know the West that Western culture, developer culture, which was kind of part of the co colonist game. They weren't thinking about the relationship no. of wetlands and estuaries no, to was, their. Own. We're we're here. We're planting our right. flag, and we're gonna conquer this land. It's and muddy. And, it's muddy. Yeah. You know, it's it's dead <laughs> space. You can't build on it. Yeah. You can't farm in it. Yeah. Oy. Yeah. All right. Well, let's pivot to wins of the week. Let's do it. We got a couple good ones. Yes. First up. We have Hela Sidibe, mm. who just completed a run across the entire United States. Um, Blake, maybe you can pull up one of those articles. This guy is so cool and inspirational. He just seems like he's overflowing with positivity <laughs> and gratitude. He's a former MLS soccer player, 
who basically just was like, I'm gonna run across the country. Mm. I think he's like a YouTuber too. Um, just completed this. Yeah, he is uh, a YouTuber. This run. Yeah. Um, and there was footage, he was live streaming it yesterday. Um, and my friend, Robbie Ballinger, who also ran across America, who's how I found out about Hella because Robbie's been really supporting him over the course of this endeavor. He flew out to the middle of the country, you know, I don't know, a couple months ago and, and ran with him for a couple of days, showed up just outside New York City to run the final leg with him. And they're all sharing it on, on Instagram live and stuff. And it was so cool because he had all, it was like a parade processional mm. as they all Amazing. advanced into the city. Amazing. He was uh, sponsored by Gymshark and Gymshark had this giant like topless bus where they were like pumping hip hop music and it was like a party going on. Yeah. And he was just like this cheerleader, you know, with a big smile on his face and just positive energy for miles as they made it into the city. It was really cool to watch. I called Robbie right after, right after it just to get his low down. And he's like, you gotta meet this guy. He's so great, you know, super cool. And what was also cool, speaking of Van Neistat and the spirited man, yes. Casey showed up to uh, document that final leg too. He was shooting, you know, all kinds of footage. So we'll see what comes out of that. That'd but it was cool episode. to see, you know, those two guys, both friends of the podcast, both friends in general, um, there to help support like this amazing human do something cool and extraordinary. And then at the finish line, it was being broadcast on on Hella's um, Instagram live, but the sound went out, so you couldn't hear anything yeah, that was going on. Yeah, I had that on. same problem. But when I talked to Robbie, he said. I told him, I was like, we couldn't, nobody could hear what was happening. And he's like, well, he proposed to his girlfriend. Oh my God. Right in Manhattan at the, at the conclusion of this 3000 mile run, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. It'd be super harsh for her to have said no. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah no. <laughs> that was obviously not yeah, gonna happen. I don't think that was gonna happen. He, he, you know what I loved about the finish was he, he sprints to the finish, then he leaps in the air. Uh huh. I mean, he's been Well, running. it was like a party going into the city. It wasn't like, they weren't like hammering, you know? But like he's it, been running every day know, for like, like well, 40 also, mile days. Well, also on top of the cross country run, he has some crazy run streak going on. Right. I think for like four the years. last four years, yeah. he hasn't missed a day of running. So and for him, it ain't nothing but a thing. Apparently he's the first black man to do the cross country run in America. Is that right? That's, I didn't know that. That's what he, that's what he said. Oh, and that's, it's been wow. written up that way. So wow. yeah. Cool, mm -hmm. I, gotta, I gotta get this guy on the show. You do? Yeah, um, gotta make that happen. So congrats, Hella. Congrats, Hella. Um, everybody should follow him on Instagram. He's hella good nine, H-E-L-L-A-H, -L -L -H, good nine. Um, that's his website up there that Blake pulled up, hellagood.com. Uh, what a stuff. Mad respect and can't wait to find a way to sit down with you and hear all about this crazy adventure. Awesome. Um, should we talk about the greatest showdown in the history of track and field that happened last week. <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> Malcolm Gladwell versus Chris Chavez. Did you watch it? I did. It was pretty impressive. I mean, Gladwell is very, very impressive. It's so funny. Yeah. I love everything about this. <laughs> I'm so here for it. Basically for those that aren't familiar, uh, Chris Chavez, who I've never met, but I feel like is an internet friend of mine. He writes for Sports Illustrated. Mm. Um, he covers track and field and marathons and the Olympics for, for that publication. He's also uh, part of Sidious Mag um, where he, I don't know if he blogs there, but he does a podcast. So he's a, he's a podcast host. He's a, he's, a, he's a announcer. He was also at this track meet, like announcing other races. Yep. He's kind of just a man about town in terms of covering track and field and marathoning in yep. the Olympics, running in the Olympics. Young guy, 27. At some point, I don't know how the genesis of this whole thing, but Chris challenged Malcolm or Malcolm, I don't know who challenged I who. thought it was Chris challenged Malcolm, but yeah. I yeah. think Chris challenged Malcolm to, uh, to run a mile, to see who could run the fastest mile. Chris, 27, Malcolm Gladwell, 58. Mm -hmm. He calls himself the skinny Canadian. He is Twitter. skinny. Like I was very shocked skinny. how like very his, skinny. his legs too. But, but kind of under, appreciated in terms of his running capability. Oh my goodness. He's a very good runner and he trains really hard. Like I know plenty of runners in New York City who will tell you like, oh, he's down at the track on the Lower East Side all the time. You know, you can find him out there. And, you know, he hits it really hard. So even though he's 58, he comes from a track field background. He was an excellent runner in high school. And I think he ran in college too um, and has stayed, 
you know, competitive. I don't think he's raced in a couple of years. So this was gonna be the first race in a while. Uh, and the lead up to this was so delicious because there was a lot of smack talking back and forth. Chris would, Chris was trying to pump people up, you know, and he said at one point, my mother is so confused why I'm racing an old man. And then Malcolm said, I'm pretty sure I'm older than your mom, <laughs> 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 which is probably true. Uh, and I can tell you from friends uh, that I have that are excellent runners who know Malcolm. I've never met Malcolm, but the word on the street is that Malcolm Gladwell is a world-class sandbagger. Like okay. he's the guy, he'll always tell you, oh, you know, I, I didn't sleep or I'm like, you know, I don't have it today. Like he'll always downplay everything <laughs> and then he'll just own you. Like that's his <laughs> MO, right? <laughs> I love that. So you come in, you set the expectation low and you create a situation in which you can over deliver. It's funny cuz he even the race started out that way like you saw him like right. he saw him like drift to the back maybe to get out of Chris's view right. or something like yeah. that and then he just tracked him down. Right. So the whole thing going into this was I'm old like you know I'm decra you know like just sandbagging mm -hmm. all the way, right? And then when you watched the mile which took place in New York City it was it was it was it was part of um you know a legitimate meet called yeah. the New York City Qualifier where a bunch of track and field athletes were trying to make Olympic trials qualifying times. Um, and it wasn't just Chris and Malcolm, it was a field of legitimate runners. They had a rabbit, they had yeah. you know, a, a bunch of you know, elite athletes running. The one, the, wo from, the, the whoop, the person who works at whoop won the thing, the woman. Um, does she work at whoop? I think so. I think she's with Tracksmith. Oh, Tracksmith. Oh, yeah, Tracksmith. I think she's with Tracksmith. Okay. Um, Malcolm's also with Tracksmith, I yeah. believe. He, she was uh, great. She so won yeah, the whole thing. She won the woman. whole thing. She crushed it. Who's all? What's her name? I'm I'm I'll blanking on her name right now. But her sister is also an exceptional track and field athlete. In any event, yeah, Malcolm goes out. Chris takes it out. I think they both had aspirations, or at least Chris publicly had aspirations of trying to break five minutes in this mm -hmm. mile. So Chris takes it out. They have a rabbit out there who's holding five minute pace. Chris is kind of sitting right behind him, but Malcolm dropped way back. So for the first half of the race. He was, you know, kind of in no man's land, way behind, and then he just picked up the pace and very slowly but legitimately worked his way up the field and just passed Chris like he was standing still and crushed him. Totally, just crushed. Unbelievable. Him. They were both quite shy of breaking five. Malcolm ran five fifteen, and Chris ran five twenty three. Chris was a good, good sport about the whole thing, uh, but I just loved that that Malcolm owned in owned owned him in that way. Me at too. 58 years of old, of age. Izzy Seidel is her name. Izzy Seidel. Yeah. yeah. So Molly Seidel is 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 Izzy's sister. And then Izzy, I think, works at Tracksmith. I don't know if she's trying to get to the Olympics or not, but she looked great and she was under five minutes. Yeah, she and she was like, like four fifty four. She or was something. like the smoothest. Like it looked like it didn't even Right. It didn't even she's phase a powerhouse. Her. Oh my goodness. You know, for sure. Yeah. Um anyway, it was super fun to watch. Yeah. Uh the YouTube of the whole thing. Well, the, the whole track meet is on YouTube, but um, you can fast forward and, and watch the race of these guys. It was really fun to see that. And that was a true, much like the Des Linden 50K yep. world record. Um, it, was a, it was a kind of an internet experience where the whole internet kind of tuned in to see how this was gonna go down. <laughs> it was great. And I think, you know, Malcolm talks about this himself quite a bit. Like, how do you make people more interested in sport? Like he's talked about how in triathlon, they should put the swimming last. Like if they wanna make it hard, yeah, right. like wear them out and then make them swim and see who survives that. Wouldn't that be more interesting? Like, you know, in his classic, like, people. In his classic <laughs> hot take, yeah, we, you know, we might have problems, yes. right? But in his classic, like, you know, contrarian hot take, you know, perspective, yeah. I think it is, um, and this race was an example of how to get people who perhaps aren't super dialed in and interested in track and field. Like I don't watch track and field meets, no. but I watch this, right. right? Like more of this please. And then perhaps we can, uh, you know, all get a little bit more excited about this stuff. So Blake just pulled up the race. Is this it? No, I think it's at like 40. Yeah, it's 45 some, uh, minutes. 45 minutes yeah. in or some 48. Um, I understand Blake. what you're saying, but I, I think I'd rather watch Usain Bolt. Listen, I'm not saying at the cost of, of <laughs> saying true track and field, but I'm saying in addition to that, I yes. think it's, 
I think it's cool to play with the format I a little too. bit. Like they're doing this with swimming. They have these pro circuit meets now where they're trying different events and sprint events and things that like get the audience, a typical audience that isn't steeped in the swimming culture yeah. to get interested about this stuff. And I feel like this accomplished that in in, in a really kind of great way. Yeah, like when way. would you ever watch this particular event? You know, like there's at least like, this is not like- No, a, right. but I was like, I was like in my car, in my, I was in the passenger seat of my car when it was going, I was like, I have to watch, I have to like, we have to pull over or you have to like, let me see what is happening right now. Like, look at him, he's got the compression socks on. Yeah, everybody's, he's, got, he's, he's in spikes too, not, in not their, everybody was in spikes. Everybody's in their twenties. But not everyone was in spikes, isn't that no, interesting? I think Chris is too. Chris is in spikes. Yeah, spikes was an interesting choice. So is um, he, he's, he doesn't do road, he mostly does track, right? He's a track guy okay. and he's super into it. Like he's on the reading the forums and he knows everything yeah. that's going on in track and field. But I just thought it was pretty great impressive. That at 58, 515 and 58, good for him, unbelievable. Steve Magnus tweeted, experience defeats youth in the running journalist slash influencer mile. They both are kind of small, right? Like Chris is well, about Chris the same is, size. Chris is more, Built like he's, well, he's got the he's same got a little size. more um, kind of bulk on him. I mean, Maybe Malcolm has the classic runner, super skinny, you know, yeah. physique. Look how easy they're so going. With, is. Like, I know it looks like it looks like they're running pace. slow. I know, it's a five minute pace. Look <laughs> how easy that is for them. I know it's crazy. <laughs> um, and lots of women in there mixing it up. Who dominated did, by a woman? Yeah, 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 for sure. She won by for like sure. twenty meters or something. But look at Malcolm just sits behind Chavez. He's just gonna let, you know, he's boat biding his time. That's the experience. Mm. That's the experience. He could create the perception that Chris was gonna run away with it. Yes. It does look like they're running slow, doesn't it? It's crazy. It does. There's an optical illusion afoot. Yeah. Anyway, um, good times. I loved it in the wake of it. Chris being a good sport tweeted, got my ass kicked in the mile by Gladwell. And then Malcolm responds to that by saying, happy to try again when you're my age and I'm 87. Yeah, cause he <laughs> wanted, cause Chris right away wanted a rematch. Yeah, yeah. We'll do it when you're, when you're my age, we'll try that. That's hilarious. Um, like I said, more of this, I think it's fun. I don't think that it, there's any negative impact to the greater track and field universe by doing stuff like this from time to time. No, I don't see, no, I mean, not at all. Like, is that, is that what someone's worried about? No, I just think like, you know, there is a, there is a, a vein of thought that is, you know, oriented around respect for traditional, the traditional way of doing it. Okay. This is track and field. Like right. how dare you, um, you know, spoil or, or, you know, corrupt our with little some universe with some stunt. Thing. Yeah, 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 you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting, you know, uh, Phil Mickelson who won a major in the PGA, he tried that when when there was no golf going on, didn't he have like put together, he and Tiger put together like uh, matches. He mm. was, one was with Peyton Manning, the other was right. with Tom Brady or something. There's Seidel, look at her crush it. Look at her. 450, yeah, 455. Let's give her 454. Yeah. Four, let's give her four, 454.67. Um, yeah, she wins by six seconds. Yeah. It's crazy. I know. Anyway, all right, let's do some listener questions. All right, let's do it. Actually, Malcolm's gonna cross here. Should we, here he comes, look at him. He worked for it. <laughs> he right? did. We are now catering to a YouTube audience that's watching with us. <laughs> we are. We are. <laughs> I don't know if that- Jason, is you might have to doing. monkey with this. Anyway, <laughs> um, cool. <laughs> listener questions, let's do it. So this is, uh, I believe it's Sierra from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Hey, Rich and Adam. My name is Sierra. I'm 23 years old and I'm currently living and going to school in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I struggled a lot with my mental health from a very young age. At about 12, I was diagnosed with clinical depression and anxiety and I struggled for a long time. Um, when I got to undergrad, I was stable in my mental health, but I realized how bad my physical health was. I've since lost 50 pounds, signed up for my first marathon this summer and just hit one year of being completely plant-based. Right now, I have a question regarding my life as it is now. Um, I'm currently struggling with the complex of, quote, doing it all. Um, I work about 35 hours a week in retail to pay my bills. Um, I'm a full-time student and a teaching assistant at the school. I dedicate at least two hours a day to practicing my craft of clarinet playing, and I exercise six days a week. 
I'm often looked up to as a leader in my role in retail and at the school. I'm often there to support other people, um, but I am living alone and halfway across the country from my family. I can't remember the last time I had a day to do nothing, and I'm loving what I'm doing, but at the same time, super exhausted. Um, any and all advice would be welcome, and thanks. Shout out to Sierra in Michigan. I know. Go blue. You're killing it. Um, <laughs> it's such a good question. I love this question. And I think it's really relevant to what we were talking about earlier about mm, balance. I agree. You know, it's it's super related to that. That's why I put that in here. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Yeah. Curating. See what I'm doing? Experience. I'm linking. Based on a theme. I'm linking you segments. Are. You are. I already told you your job is secure. <laughs> Have you seen my swim mask? Yeah, I have. Okay. I have. And I didn't, did I make fun of you? <laughs> no, I did not. I said, we reached a detente in the Oslo talks. Um, Sierra, great question. I think this is a, a common predicament for many. The first thought that comes to mind is, is, uh, is something I learned in sobriety, which is this idea of the road is always getting narrower. Right, so you start out, you have these mental health struggles, you seem to get on top of that. You then set your sights on your physical health, you lose all this weight, you run a marathon. It's like, I got it together, but the road continues to narrow and you're faced new challenges that force you to confront yourself in, in, in deeper ways. Like you've done this heavy lifting in these other areas and now this other stuff is showing up. And I think what you're experiencing is, is really common to a lot of people Again, it's related to our conversation about balance, very much rooted in that. And I think, you know, based upon what you're saying, that your life is not, the way you're living your life right now is not sustainable in the long term. I think you're doing what you need to survive at the moment and pursue your goals and, and really uh, develop your, your, your craft and your talent and your passion. And I think it's super laudable, like mad, respect for everything that you've taken on, everything that you're shouldering right now to make all of this happen. And I think, you know, at 23, you're young, you can handle it for now, but you have taken on a lot. And I think, you know, you're gonna need to really, and it sounds like you're already doing this, like figure out a way to um, pursue this path in a more sustainable way. And I suspect just based upon the way you've described yourself that you're somebody who has a, predisposition to over deliver and everything that you do. Do you get that sense, Adam? No doubt. Yeah, yes. she's crushing it, yeah. right? Like she's showing up and killing it in all these different areas. But I think over time, when you are that kind of person and you shoulder that kind of responsibility and you create those expectations with other people that you're engaged with, it's going to drain the joy out of everything that you're doing and it will inevitably lead to burnout. So that's the first thing. I also, and tell me what you think, Adam, I also smell a little hint of, of, of codependence in this, this idea that Sierra is overgiving of herself to meet everyone else's needs. Like mm -hmm. she's, she, everybody in the retail job loves her and she's a TA, so she's there for her students. She's showing up for all these other people mm -hmm. at the cost of her own well being, which is secondary. So she goes home at night completely depleted yeah. and lonely because she's living alone. Yeah. So I think the first thing is figuring out how to- Maybe because um, she can't do that for her family because they're far away. So it's a, a kind of a sub for that. Right, well, I'd be interested in what the family dynamic is, yeah. right? Like, so is she somebody who in her rearing was somebody who showed up for other people in her family in the same way that she's doing this for her students and in her retail job, I would suspect that that's <laughs> that's likely. H highly likely. Yeah, yeah, right? So here she is alone, doesn't have the family support and doesn't have that outlet for, you know, showing up for other people as she did, you know, in the house growing up and she's doing it in this other way. So I think I think Sierra you need to flip the script and and first understand and accept that you can't be everything to everybody all the time. And as a, you know, as a people pleaser myself, I, I get it. Mm. But the question really should be, how do you please yourself? And by please yourself, I don't mean that in, in an indulgent or, or selfish way, but really what do you need to make sure that your needs are being taken care of so that you're fit 
adequately fit to show up for these other people and in all of these other areas of your life. There's a great Marcus Aurelius quote that I think is relevant to this. He said, I have often wondered how it is that every man loves himself more than all the rest of men, but yet sets less value on his own opinion of himself than on the opinion of others. So again, this is a bit of a projection Sierra because I don't know you, but it sounds like you are somebody who does concern herself with the opinion of the people in your retail job mm-hmm. and you know these students that you're TA like all these different jobs that you have and you're coming last in this mm. and as a result you're suffering so i think you need to get really clear on what your main priorities are first and foremost figure out a way so that you can focus on that and learn to be okay with imperfection in your other areas, especially in regards to these less important facets of your life. Like you're re- like I presume that you're not pursuing a career in retail, you're trying to become this unbelievable clarinet performer, right? right? So how can you, and it's tough, like these are real life problems. You gotta pay your bills, you're working right. two jobs, you're a full-time student. Like this is not an easy equation to solve. So the last thing I wanna do is come across as like pithy with all of this because it's very difficult. But I do think a process or a strategy for tackling this is to A, do an honest inventory of everything that you do. Literally get a notepad or a moleskin and journal how you spend your time in 15 minute increments. Do that over a week and I think you'll get an objective picture on how you're actually spending your time. There probably will be surprising areas where you're spending more time doing something than you originally thought that you were. That will give you a launch pad to then evaluate what it is that you could possibly let go of or deescalate and other areas of your life that are not getting the adequate amount of attention and give you a roadmap for how you could perhaps simplify your life. Like if your life is so crowded and so complicated that you're going from one thing to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, never really having the bandwidth to invest in any self care whatsoever. And then just coming home and crashing, you know, that's not a great life plan. And as somebody who's trying to cultivate a creative talent, you need that nurturing time in order to really connect with the best of what you have to offer with respect to this art form that you're pursuing. You just can't succeed in life. You can't succeed in your goals unless you take care of yourself first. And you actually can't adequately take care of all these other people that you're trying to take care of right now, unless you take care of yourself first. So approach it, not from the perspective of that being indulgent or selfish, but actually necessary in terms of you optimizing the opportunity that you have right now to step into becoming this artist. 100%. What do you think? I think you nailed it. I think, uh, you know, prioritizing where you can find time for yourself is gonna be key to, because it's a long haul to become great and master of a craft like the clarinet Mm -hmm. and and you need to, you, you can't afford to burn out no. And a lot of musicians do because it's so competitive and, 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 and it's sometimes the satisfaction you get of doing a good job at a retail job is more readily, it comes to you easier. Right, you'll get the validation immediately. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or as a leader in whatever, right. that's why a lot of people take certain jobs because they're elevated as leaders right away. And leadership can be fulfilling because mm-hmm. you're helping people mm-hmm. achieve something. So she's on the grind though. This it reminds me of law school. Like when you're that age, you can you can do it. Yeah. And you could do it for a while. Yeah. You know, you could do it, like I couldn't do that now. I would, you know, collapse. But when you're 23, you're robust, you can handle it. But I just think it's it's a time in your life where you have an opportunity to develop healthier life skills around these things. And you really need to protect what's most important to you. 100%. Cool. Good luck, Sierra. Good luck. Thank you for the question. All right, let's go up towards the Bay Area. This person recorded their question on their own mic. You don't have to do that to people. Wow. I know. Well, he, he, he did record it on our 
um, system on our phone line, but that he got cut off. And so now I'm, I am- uh, um, He like sent an audio file so or something? he sent the audio file. You, okay. you emailed this to me. And so now I'm finding it and it's coming your way. Hey, Rich, this is Kevin from San Francisco Bay Area. I'm a fan of the gospel that you're spreading, and I really appreciate your recent episode with Matthew Walker on sleep. I have a question that I think you are uniquely positioned to help answer. See, sometimes I'll do an intense workout at around noonish. I'll run, bike, swim, or do some at-home P90X, which all burn a lot of calories. So immediately after my workout, I'll have a high-calorie plant-based recovery smoothie, like one of the recipes in the Plant Power Way. And then a little later, I'll eat some other foods and meals like a big bowl of oatmeal and later another huge bowl of salad for dinner. And many times I'll also sneak in a large veggie smoothie. I try to focus on consuming as much leafy greens and micronutrients as possible while also trying to get in my needed macros, but also not trying to overdo my macros too much as I tend to gain weight pretty easily. However, sometimes it seems like I'm not consuming enough calories because once it gets time for bed, I'll feel pretty full, mostly because of all the greens that I've consumed. But then over time, while I'm in bed, my body will feel light, jittery, and hungry to the point that I'll need to get out of bed and go to the kitchen and eat something more. Only now that I've eaten a plant-based late night snack, the fiber in that vegan snack starts to churn in my digestive system, uh, including smoothies, which prevents me from further being able to fall asleep. It's kind of this catch-22 scenario. Anyway, thank you, Rich. Awesome. Yes. Story of my life, Kevin. Story of my life. Really? Yeah. Because I, I immediately thought he's just not eating enough calories. Yeah. Well, I think that's a huge part of it. Like he's just eating too huge, much salad and oatmeal. You burn through that stuff. Yeah. I think that, I think he's under, I think he's, because he was obese and he lost all this weight and he's trying to be, first of all, thank you for your question, Kevin. I yes. love this question. Um, because he's, he's formerly obese, and he's trying to be really diligent about his nutrition going forward and is so cautious and afraid of putting on weight because of that past experience right. that he's under fueling himself yep. because he's terrified of putting on weight. But what he's doing is he is not getting enough calories and that's creating the agitation that's leading to the sleep problem. It's an interesting thing. I've experienced this myself um, and you know, all all the the thing is, all the science supports not eating right before bed. Right? right, you're not supposed to eat right before you go to bed. Right, you're supposed to eat hours before. If I eat like three hours before bedtime and then I go to bed, inevitably, I will either be unable to fall asleep or I'll, or I'll wake up like two or three hours later and have to go into the kitchen and eat more. Really, all the time. Mm. So that has led to an unhealthy habit of eating close to my bedtime, which isn't great because then as your body is digesting the food, when it's done with that digestive process, you end up waking up, like right. I wake up at like three, right? I've, right? I've played with this so many different ways. So I feel you, Kevin, I relate to this. Um, you know, I'm also, you know, I wasn't formerly obese, I was heavier, but I'm conscious of my caloric intake. So I tend to eat light during the day and then have a larger dinner, but I've had that same experience of, of lying in bed, awake, hungry, unable to sleep, all the stuff. I don't have a magic bullet for this, but two things. One is the thing we already mentioned, which is I think that you really are under fueled. Mm. And that sense of fullness isn't due to you meeting your caloric needs. It's because you're eating this super fibrous. Very bloaty stuff, right? Bloaty stuff that gives you the sensation of being full and is great because it will prevent you from overeating. And it you know basically turns off that appetite mechanism. But all those leafy greens, all of that fiber, very high in the micronutrients and the phytochemicals and all those things that you want. But at the same time, if you're working out as hard as you're working out, like you got to put food in your system. Yeah. And when you're Smoothies not eating, aren't good enough. when you're not eating meat and dairy, which tend to be incredibly calorically dense foods, that's this is a common thing with people who go plant based. They're like, I'm always hungry, and it's like, well, you used to eat like burgers and you know milkshakes and now you're eating salads and quinoa like you're going right. to you're going to have to eat a lot more than you're used to eating and because if you're eating it in a whole food way like there is all that extra fiber so you'll feel full but you're actually not you know not getting sufficient calories to right. and your body is like I'm trying to repair myself like I'm the agitation like that 
that kind of shakiness that you get is your body trying to tell you that you need to eat more. The other thing that I think it could be helpful for you is that I found, and this is purely anecdotal, but I found personally that when I eat more throughout the day, that's helpful. So with this you know, penchant that I have for eating light throughout the day, sometimes that will lead to this problem at night, even if I eat a big dinner. But when I'm, when I'm eating, you know, when I'm not like doing an intermittent fast or whatever, and I'm, I'm eating throughout the day and I eat a decent lunch and all of that, then I can eat a decent dinner and I'll find myself uh, less, uh, in less of a struggle to, to, go, to go to sleep. So larger portions eaten consistently and earlier throughout the day will, will I think help ameliorate that. Um, yeah, because what you're talking about here is working out really hard then having a smoothie then having a bowl of oatmeal and a salad. Like to me, like, like that's just not enough right. food. I think that's right. Yeah, because right. I'll have oatmeal in the morning before, even before a run or mm-hmm. like an hour or so before a swim. Right, he didn't talk about anything that he eats before noon. So right. I don't know if he's not eating before noon or he's eating a breakfast that he just didn't tell us about. Who knows, but it, like, you know, the, I, I'm not telling anyone what to eat. I, I'm not in that business, but pasta is a very filling thing that could be good if you if you need carb. I know, I know it's, well, uh, I don't know how controversial it is to eat pasta. Pasta's but, not, pasta wouldn't be the first thing that I recommend. Right. Pasta is very effective. If you eat that right before you go to bed, you'll pass out. Right. <laughs> Cause all the blood goes to your belly so to not, digest this food. <laughs> you'll eat, wake up at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> don't eat so pasta. So I don't know if it's, you know, it will do the <laughs> trick in terms of getting you to fall asleep. Not sure that's the best practice, okay. but perhaps, you know, get over this fear of macros and start, you know, eating complex carbohydrates that are satiating. You can eat potatoes, you can yeah. eat sweet potatoes, you can eat long grain rice. Like there's plenty of things Curries, that you could be beans eating. beans and rice. Yeah, tons yeah. of beans. Yeah. I eat gigantic, gigantic bowls of beans and rice. Yeah. My kids still like, we'll get, pl- you know, we go to the dinner table, they have, get their normal plates out and I'll go and I'll get the giant like salad bowl. Mm. And then I put my dinner in that and they laugh every time, yeah. but I just feel like I got, I have to eat more. So, you know, eat, eat avocados. Like that's Tom Brady eats, drinks mm. avocados. You can eat avocados. Right. And I think, you know, I think there is a little bit of a, a block here because of that fear of, of gaining weight. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, maybe you need to, you know, in letting go of that, be okay with putting on a little bit of weight as you as you figure this out for yourself because what you want to do is 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 have the weight come off the right way so it stays off. Well, but if you're constantly starving and not sleeping well because you're afraid of putting on weight, you're not going to sustain this anyway. No. And you're going to end up lapsing back into some unhealthy habits. Alexei Molchanov once told me years ago, the, the great free diver world record holder said, "It's not the number of that's on the scale, it's 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 how it's okay to have a bigger number if it's if you're fit. Right. Fitness and how fitness, do you feel? Fitness and the and the number on the scale are two separate things. You don't have to they don't mean the same mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Good point. Yeah. Um final thought uh for Kevin is to and he didn't talk about this at all, which I think he which is instructive that he didn't bring it up, but I'm curious about what his pre-sleep routine is. Like perhaps there's some work that you could do around setting yourself up for a good yeah. night of sleep. Like, are you having a magnesium tea at night? Are you avoiding those screens? Do you take a bath? You know, maybe take a warm bath like an hour before you go to bed, do, a, do an evening meditation, listen to, you know, get the call map out and listen to a sleep story. Like part of this might also be induced by anxiety. Like yeah. what, what part of this is, is is more of a mental emotional thing and what part of it is actually a physiological response to his food intake. It's and unclear. if all else fails, listen to roll on. You'll go, right. go right out. Right, get a tent, <laughs> cold air in the room, get a face mask, a gravity blanket. Yes. The world is your oyster, Kevin. And David Attenborough, you know, he puts me right to sleep. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there's certain people, right? <laughs> yes. Nature sounds, whatever does it for you. Um, cool. But hey, thanks for the question. Hope that was helpful. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. And thanks for the great recording. That's right, his own mic. I know. Should we require that everybody have their own mic now? No, (laughs) this makes my job a lot harder. Please don't. All right. Uh, The last one is a fun one from a friend in Columbus. Hey, Rich and Adam, this is Ben calling from Columbus, Ohio. 
I recently packed up my things, left my job, and decided to go on a road trip out west for four months. I got two questions for you guys. One, what book would you bring on a road trip for yourself? And secondly, Adam, I know you're looking for running questions, so I've been a road runner my whole life, and I'm excited to hit the trail. What tips do you have for me to transition from pavement to trail running? Thanks. Adam, what do you think the odds are that Ben's four-month trip turns into a one-year trip? High. I think it's high. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. I hope, I, I hope that it, for right? him. Huh? Extend it. Is Ben I'm seem jealous. young to you? Or is Ben mid-career? I can't tell. I can't tell. He didn't, he didn't leave his age, right? Yeah. Um, well, he had a job, so he's not like just graduating from college or I, something I feel like, like it's the first job out of college though. I think like so. First I, or second. I'd, 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 I'd pen, him, pen him at, you know, maybe 24, okay. 25, I don't know. Yeah. I hope, I hope we're not way off on that. Yeah. Um, I suspect mid twenties, but thanks for the question, Ben. I am jealous. That sounds like such a cool opportunity to just hit the road four months, the world is your oyster. <laughs> yes, you know what too. I mean? Quit when life job, was simple, car. Adam, when <laughs> life was simple. Hey, we had our run. I know we did, right? Yes. I'm happy where I'm at. I'm good, I'm, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry, Ben, we, we're back <laughs> yeah. to ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Books, <laughs> Books. You can't go on a four month road trip, this, you know, yeah. this lighting out on the frontier. Yes. In, in a in a in a journey of self discovery, head west without reading on the road mm. by Jack Kerouac. Are you even allowed to go on a four month road trip without on as the a road? young man without having read on the road? You know, I mean, on the road is a seminal book for me. I've probably read it ten times. Um, I didn't include that on my list. It's since such you, a Gen you X. You had first. You had first. It's a Gen dibs. X boomer referral, though, is it not? It is. It might be. It may. I, has that book been canceled? Can we check the cancellation file? <laughs> I don't know. I who's, think it's okay still. Who's, who's in charge of the cancellation vault? <laughs> I think that one's right? all right. I think it is too. Yeah. Um, so I would recommend that, but you, sorry, I was like, you were about to say something else. No, I, I think it's a great question. I think, you know, it's the two-parter, go for it. You have, you have a few books down here. Right, well, I'm just thinking, okay, Ben, what's going on in Ben's life that he decided to quit his job, pack everything up and like head out on the road? Yeah. Well. Obviously, it feels like an inflection point where he wants to go inward a little bit and figure out what the next thing is, mm. or you know maybe connect a little bit more deeply with with who he is. And so, what are the books that you would recommend somebody who's you know playing around with that on the road because you're on the road? Right. Um, why not uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl mm. tops everybody's <laughs> list? You know who's who's grappling with these ideas, I think. And one of my favorites also, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. Yeah. I wanted to like that one, I, I couldn't. Couldn't get behind I it? I couldn't, couldn't get through it. Too magical, too crazy? I think my problem with dense. it was every chap chapter ended well. Yeah. You know, because his life was, you know, he was a magnificent human being. I'm very a big fan of Paramahansa Yogananda. Uh -huh. I just didn't get through the entire autobiography. I think it's just a cool book to expand your sense of possibility and develop some appreciation for the mystical. So my, you wanna hear a Paramahansa yeah. Yogananda story? I do. Before we get into finish this question. Uh, so during, I think it was during the LA yoga days when we first started LA Yoga Magazine, I set up a meeting with the head of the Self-Realization Fellowship at the time. I think it was number, maybe it was number two. Mm. Um, and their headquarters are in Mount Washington in Los Angeles, right. which was the original house, the original estate before any, any of the others. That's where he set Parmanahansa Yogananda set up shop. And we were supposed to have our meeting in the boardroom, which has like all these really cool artifacts and stuff. And I was really excited to sit there and have this conversation, but we got booted. And I was a little disappointed, but he goes, you know, let's sit by the fireplace. And the guy wasn't particularly warm or anything uh -huh. or like memorable. But he said, you know, a lot of people say after, you know, he used to spend every evening down here having tea by the fireplace every every evening, and had whoever guests came through, that's where he'd spend his time. And they say, you know, you'd f people can feel his presence sometimes. And at the time, 
I wasn't particularly a huge Paramahansa Yogananda guy because he was merging, you know, his worldview with Jesus and, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make yoga more palatable by using Christianity as some sort of a Trojan horse, say, mm -hmm. or not even a Trojan, that's a disrespectful way of putting it, but to show the, how they fit together. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I was like, like pretty new to, to that world. Had my interview with him, like I said, he was, not super impressed with me. I didn't really like him that much. <laughs> but then we finished the interview fine. And I get up and am walking out the door and I'm like, like physically high. Like I'm floating out of my body kind of high. Like I'm just like wow. lightheaded, like my all my energy, exact flow state kind of stuff. Like seriously, like time slowed down. I felt it a few times in my life, but this was very profound. Wow. And not, no drugs, no nothing. You know, like it felt like the coming on of a psychedelic trip without taking any drugs. That's what it felt like. So what do you make of that? Uh, Yogananda. Yeah. Yeah, no question. That's a trip. Isn't man. that cool? That is a trip. So for, for people that don't know, Paramahansa Yogananda was, was many things, but he was one of the initial, uh, people to come from India to the United States and was part of the movement of introducing yoga yep. and meditation and all these things that have become so integrated into our culture at a time when these were crazy brand new ideas. Yeah, and the, like the 1920s yeah. he was coming here and yeah. you know. And he would sit in these salons in Manhattan mm -hmm. and you know, have these get togethers that are reminiscent of, you know, that movie, The Master. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what comes to mind, like yeah. what that vibe must've been like. Um, but just a beautiful, you know, magnificent consciousness. There's that headquarters on Mount Washington, but there's also the self-realization retreat center in, in Pacific Palisades where you can, the grounds are open and there's yeah. this pond and you can go and meditate there. And also the temple in Encinitas which right on the beach, which one. is yeah. the surf spot right Swamis. off of it is called Swamis. Yeah, and yeah, I think a yeah. lot of people don't know that that's why <laughs> no. it's called Swamis. Yeah, I agree. You know, but that's, he is the Swami. So if you don't read the book, uh, ben, make sure you stop by one of his. You should go. Sites. Yeah, you should. Yeah. You should read the book and then go visit one of those sites. Exactly. Read the book. Don't yeah. take. Don't worry about me. <laughs> I'm the guy that the Self Realization Fellowship didn't even like. <laughs> you're a, but you're an unlikely person to have that kind of you know experience and then admit to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're you have a practical, grounded you know perspective. Yeah. No, that happens. Things, so yeah. That's very cool. Um, my Kerouac of choice is the Dharma Bums. Um, I On the Road was very important to me um, because it gives permission to be expansive. It gives permission to reach for some um, expansive sense of self and joy in the moment and, and not be someone who's about collecting uh, stuff and right. putting it in their stuff house. Um, and that's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Like I, I still am guided by that in some degree, to some degree. Mm -hmm. The Dharma bums though, it comes after On the Road has, it is On the Road's in the can. Everyone loves it as publishers. It's not out yet. And he goes on one last road trip before it becomes this massive hit. He's written it, it's all done. And this is the next thing that he does. And he does another cross country trip and he meets up with his buddies in the Bay Area and Oregon and he ends up, um, as a lookout in a fire tower in Washington state. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more meditation and mindfulness. So this is where the beats start to get credit for bringing in Eastern practices and mindfulness into their, and, and, and meditation yeah. into their work, which became mainstreamed. Um, and I love Dharma bums. Um, Island of the Blue Dolphins by Scott O'Dell is a classic for around here. It t it's about, uh, it's actually about a little Chumash girl who is, kind of moored and left behind with her little brother on one of the channel islands here. And it's what happens to her as she fends for herself for over a decade, I believe it yeah. is, or maybe it's- My daughter read that book in school. Yeah, it's, it's now, it's taught in school, but I never read it until later. Um, I read it in maybe one big gulp, like sitting down in the yeah. sun. It's one, like an adventure book. So like, and but it's, it's so beautiful and it talks about, uh, you know, the Channel Islands here. Yeah, so I, and I how, love this, that book. how she survived. Incredible. It's crazy. Like, I don't even want to spoil anything. Yeah. It's very, it's sad at first, but it ends up being quite incredible. Mm. Um, and then Evening in Paradise by Lucia Berlin, who's an overlooked short story author. I think I might've referenced her with the Rachel Kushner stuff, but she is, uh, 
she was like, she didn't have any hits. She was like revered by her peers, considered um, in like the 60s, 70s, maybe 70s and 80s, considered one of these great, the female Raymond Carver, short story writer, but just couldn't get any traction commercially and had to do odd jobs basically her whole life until she had a collection called The Confessions of a Cleaning Woman came out very late career when she was like suffering health problems from, uh, I think alcoholism was involved, involved in that. And she ends up having a be like late career bestseller and is a faculty at the University of Colorado. But before that, she was a cleaning woman. She was X, she was Y, she was like, she lived this very outsized, huge life. Um, and Evening in Paradise is a second collection. I think it came out posthumously. Um, but to me is my, is I enjoyed that one be better than the, the wow. Confessions of a Cleaning Yeah, woman. I haven't read that often. And that includes that. like, she grew up a diplomat's daughter in Chile. She has this crazy mm. life, but it's semi-autobiographical stuff. It's, it is fiction. So you just don't really know where the line is, mm -hmm. but it's a lot of fun. You see we did there. What's that? Whoops, did I just call Siri? No, I didn't say Siri. <laughs> I said, I see what you, you, do you see what you did there? Siri, go away. No, what did I do? Um, just when, Everybody thought that this was a swim run conversation. You reminded everybody that this is truly a literary podcast. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but now back to running. Back to running. Rich, switching tell him, it up. Tell them how so to go confusing. from. Tell them how what, to go from road to what trail. What does your podcast do? <laughs> My podcast. <laughs> what did no? It's the question again. Like, I know. What does your podcast do? I know. What what a does little it bit do? of everything, I suppose. Um, road to trail. Don't overthink it. It doesn't have to be that different. I mean, I would say as Ricky Gates says, fun over fast. When you're on the road, you have this tendency because it's a straight line or what have you to be really wed to the Garmin, all the metrics, what's your pace, what's your cadence, what's your heart rate. You can get really dialed in on that because it is, you know, you're limiting your variables. But once you get on a trail, all that goes out the window. So I would encourage you. I mean, I don't know what your relationship is to, to road running. So maybe you're already cool with letting go of all of that. For some, it's a challenge to just, you know, be present for the experience, let go of pace, let go of cadence and just enjoy yourself and allow your mind to wander and your senses to experience the environment. It's not that different, but you know, it does, it depends on the trail, of course. Like, is it technical? Is it flat? Is it super steep? You will in general have to be a little bit more hyper vigilant about your environments. Like, are there crazy wild animals around here? You have to be vigilant about your foot placement. Are there roots and rocks that you can trip on? Um, one thing that was helpful to me when I was trying to get used to running on trails is, is this idea of letting the trail work for you. Like if you're running downhill on a road, it's one thing, but on a trail, you can kind of bound from rock to rock and kind of, be more in like 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 surfing, like riding mm. a wave, as opposed to, you know, forcing yourself into a certain kind of pace, like gliding the descents, learning how to be light on your feet, and then delicate on the ascents until you develop some kind of confidence. And then I would just say, you know, it's more important that you take safety precautions because, especially if you're you're going on a road trip, you're in the middle of nowhere, you want to go on this trail, nobody knows where you are. Yeah. Who knows if any people are out there? You get bit by a rattlesnake, or you just fall down and twist your ankle, and you can't run. You know, you got to make sure that you have a phone with you. That there is cell service. There are things like on on Strava, you can do like you can broadcast live or you can let certain people know where you are so that there's some accountability oh, nice. if something happens to you. Yes. Um, make sure that you have a hydration pack and you know are taking care of all that kind of stuff. Um, and then one final little piece of, of practical advice is to get the All Trails app, um, which is a great app and it shows you where all the trails are wherever you're traveling. So you can, it makes that discovery process a little bit easier. Beautiful. Cool. Are we done? Yeah, any more books you wanna tell us about? <laughs> I think <laughs> no. Okay, I kept I kept the books down to four this you time. Did. Is that okay? It was good though. No, you're you're in. Uh, you know, speaking of dharma bums, you are in your dharma when you're discussing literature. It's beautiful to watch. You know, it's very kind it. of you to say that. Yes, you know, but re reality. Um, I am I am not an in crowd literary person by mm, any means. It's but, not about that. No, but I do love it. How's the novel coming? It's coming, man. We're okay. about, we're almost done with a third pass, and then there'll be a fourth cool. pass, and we'll keep going. But the uh, 
One thing about books that I love is like you can, I was reading this at the same time I was reading um, uh, something, well, uh, what's the, what's the mini series? Like it was- uh, The mini series. No, the- The Thorn Birds. <laughs> no, no, the, um, God, why am I spacing on it? The, the John Le, Brown, Le the John Brown uh, series with Ethan Hawke. Oh, uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. What's it? it has a crazy name. I yeah. know exactly what you're saying. Uh, bird. Uh, 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 I know what it is. Out. I know what it is. We'll find it. Good Lord Bird. Good Lord Bird. Sorry yes. about that. Yeah. Good Lord Bird. Based on an amazing book. Yes. And I was reading that at the same time I was reading this. And then I also got this new translation of the Tao Te Ching. And I was thinking of like, what other mode do we have where you could be in, you know, pre-Civil War time, early 20th century Hawaii uh, and, you know, whatever, like BC, China, only books. Mm -hmm. Nothing else can even come close to it. Well, virtual reality is gonna catch up to that. <laughs> Don't worry about the books. Yes, that's true. Right? VR, VR is next. Yeah, <laughs> just some tweak on the simulation. Time travel. That's right. Would you do coming, it? Like if someone came in here right now week. with a time travel portal, and said, we don't know when we can, we can get you back. We don't know how long it will take. And you don't know, what, do you know what, t what you era choose, you're going you into? You get to choose the era. I think we have a romantic attachment with, to, to you know, certain periods of time thinking yeah. that they were better than they were. That was never more evident than watching the Nick. <laughs> and you just see like, I'm so glad that I didn't live in 1900. Yeah. It just looked, Awful. Oh yeah. You know. Well, th there'd be plumbing issues. Yeah, everybody stank. Everybody was dying of disease yeah. everywhere. It was, you know, like if you had a medical problem, good luck. Mm. Like it was, you know, but you think like, oh, how cool would it be to live in Manhattan in 1900 or 1920 or one of these times, you know, right. the, the roaring twenties and all of that. But I think if you spent a week there when you've right. lived a life of iPads and Netflix, right. you'd lose your mind. So basically like if they said it could take a year to get you back, would I go back? But you can choose where and when, would you do it? Probably, yeah. because cause why not? Because what an extraordinary experience. Exactly, and where would you go? Maybe Paris in the 1920s. Nice. I don't know, maybe that's not thinking broadly or more or creatively hey, enough. Sounds where would cool you go? Me. Where would you go? That's a good question. I'm asking the questions around here, you Rich. Are. Yeah, it's like on your literary <laughs> podcast. All right, listen, we've been going for well over two hours. We're ending this thing. We could talk about time travel and the simulation next time. <laughs> yes. VR. Let's do it. What's better, VR or books? R. R is Debate. better. <laughs> R is always better than VR. Yeah. All right, man. You feel good? I do. I feel good, man. I'm, sorry I'm for over my languishing, man. I think. Thank you. For Did we de-languish you? I'm, I've been de-languished. Fantastic. Yes. Wait till you Thank try you. on this mask. I can't, uh, that's never gonna happen. <laughs> never. <laughs> cut, smash cut to me on Instagram wearing that mask, <laughs> right? Yes. All right, see you in two weeks. Maybe we might have to postpone because oh, of right. the, the, you're, you're gonna go see the Iron Cowboys. So we'll, yeah, we might have to rearrange that. Maybe not in two weeks, we'll figure it out. Yeah. In the meantime, follow Adam on the internets at Adam Skolnick. Leave us a message with your question, 424-235-4626. Check out the show notes on the episode page at richroll.com for links to everything we talked about today. We'll also put links up in the description below if you're watching this on YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, subscribe to our channel on YouTube, subscribe to our Clips channel, and you can find us on Apple, Spotify, all the places. If you wanna be super generous, throw a few stars at us, say a few mm. nice things. I say that to friends and enemies alike. Yes. Um, what else? I think that's it. Shout out Brogan Graham. Shout out to Brogan. We work through, we're in a good place, <laughs> audience, all of us, right? Good. How's your short short film practice going? Um, I we're sent a, a couple, a, I sent a, a couple. Group, we're on a group chat. I sent a couple from uh, the, know, the mountains. But are you doing it with other people? No, I have not expanded it you out. Need, yeah, that's the thing. It's amazing to me how many of these broken ass go. He's a full-time production <laughs> studio. I know. Really and then he edits them and creates movies out of, you know, like his library of- He's got like, you know what, Brogan? You have a very, a very handsome, 
creative group of people that you're doing these with. Yeah. Thank you for including us. Yeah. Or thank me. you. We love you, Brogan. Yeah. I got to thank everybody who helped yeah, put on it. the show today. Do it. Let's thank Jason Camiello sitting right behind me. Audio engineer, production, show notes, interstitial music. Jason has a tendency to wake up at three in the morning and just to make sure that the podcast goes live. Wow. He goes overboard. Blake Curtis, who creates the video version of the podcast has a, pen, has a penchant for coming in Sunday afternoons to make sure that the video is dialed up. These guys work really hard. Mm. Thank you to both of them. I could not do what I do without their help. Jessica Miranda for graphics. We got, who do we have in today? Grayson. Who do we have? We have Grayson Wilder over here shooting portraits. New on the team. Thank you, Grayson. Georgia Whaley for copywriting DK for advertiser relationships, theme music by Tyler Trapper and Harry. We will see you back here when we see you. We will be back here with another cool episode in a couple of days until then. Namaste, Paramahansa Yogananda. Namaste. Peace. Plants. Coyote. <laughs> <laughs>